Good morning and welcome to today's Huawei's Ultra Broadband Forum 2021, which is entitled Extend Connectivity and Drive Growth. My name is Mark Forker. I'm the editor of Computer News Middle East, which is the region's leading IT and technology publication. I'm absolutely delighted to have been afforded the opportunity to moderate today's session, uh, which really does have some of the most prominent thought leaders and key decision makers from the IT, technology and telecommunications sector here today to share their insights on the technologies and trends that are really fueling new innovations that are going to empower and make our society a better place for us all to live. A key theme or topic of today's session will of course be digital transformation. We have heard a lot about it, um, especially over the last 18 months we've seen an exponential increase in, in digital transformation and we will examine and explore the role played by Huawei and its partners in terms of leveraging their diverse portfolio of technologies and solutions to really help customers overcome the challenges they have faced on their digital transformation journeys. We know that companies that resist digitalization will not thrive and survive in today's digital economy. So it does promise to be a great session. Our first presentation today will be delivered by Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin. She is the Director of Telecommunications Development Bureau at the ITU. She'll share her insights from the perspective of ITU and give us her expectation from today's Ultra Broadband Forum. So that's enough from me. Unfortunately, Doreen can't be with us here physically due to ongoing travel restrictions, so she will deliver her presentation virtually. Uh, so that's enough from me. I'll hand you over now to Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin from ITU to kickstart today's Ultra Broadband Forum. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, 2020 was the year when the dial on broadband connectivity shifted sharply from desirable to essential. For much of the world, a return to pre-pandemic normality has yet to materialize. As nations struggle to find a way to transition out of the pandemic, broadband connectivity continues to play a pivotal role in sustaining countries, communities, and individuals. Remote working remains, distance learning and hybrid education structures remain in place in many countries. But the massive spike in the use and the importance of broadband connectivity brought on by the crisis stands in sharp contrast to the slowing global growth in internet users and a persistent and pernicious digital divide. Right now, 3.7 billion people remain totally offline. Our figures show that while close to 87% of people in developed countries are using the internet, fewer than one in four people in the 46 least developed countries was online. With COVID now turbocharging digital transformation, a situation where billions of people are deprived of a resource increasingly regarded as basic infrastructure in the world's richer countries can simply no longer be tolerated. And thanks to decades long efforts to roll out basic telecom services, some form of network coverage actually now reaches nearly every single human on the planet via terrestrial or satellite networks. That's an impressive achievement, but it's no longer enough. It is time to dramatically accelerate efforts to upgrade, to extend, and to densify broadband infrastructure and close the broadband usage gap by improving affordability and nurturing digital skills. On the specifics of investment and financing, Samina's CEO, Bokar Ba, co-chaired an important working group of the Broadband Commission on 21st century financing. Last month, the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development also released its annual State of Broadband report on global connectivity. The report calls for a renewed focus on broadband investment, but it also calls for a much stronger focus on individual needs. The digital divide is linked to a wide range of factors, including age, 
gender, income, education, and place of residence. Lack of infrastructure is just one barrier. The human element of connectivity, digital skills, support for local digital innovation, digital education resources, and meaningful digital content in formats that are actionable and appropriate to local users is just as important. Inclusive, open, multi-stakeholder connectivity partnerships will be an essential pillar in advancing progress towards universal broadband access. Our Connect to Recover initiative that was launched with the support of the government of Japan and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia aims to strengthen countries' digital infrastructure ecosystems. We're also working with Huawei to build a global research community that will help to promote knowledge sharing that informs targeted practices aimed at stronger recovery with broadband. Platforms such as this forum taking place during JITEX and the Dubai World Expo are moments for private sector, for government, and also wider stakeholder conversations on leveraging technology to advance digital transformation. Recognizing the critical role that partnerships will play towards our goal of connecting the unconnected, the ITU has launched the Partner to Connect Digital Coalition. Partner to Connect will mobilize commitments, resources, and partnerships. ITU's World Telecommunications Development Conference in 2022 will leverage the unprecedented global attention on connectivity to regenerate the agenda to bring broadband for all. Broadband connectivity has never mattered more, but we will never realize the truly transformational impact of that connectivity until its benefits are shared among us all equally. Thank you very much. Big thank you to Doreen Bogdan Martin from the ITU there for that wonderful presentation in which she outlined the tremendous value of ultra-brand connections to human development. And it's Huawei's hope that partners across the industry chain will work together to promote the development of the ultra-broadband industry. Connectivity, as we know, is changing our lives and accelerating the development of industries. However, it will also change our future. We're now going to hear from Ryan Ding, Executive Director of the Board and President of the Carrier Business Group of Huawei, to explain in more detail the impact that can be had with improved connectivity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the 7th Ultra Broadband Forum, co-hosted by UN Broadband Commission and Huawei. Expo 2020 is also taking place in Dubai right now. The city is now a hub for technology, innovation, and culture exchanges. Although I could not be here in person, connectivity is bringing us together. Connectivity is changing our lives. More than 170 years ago, the world's first submarine cable was laid, sending the first communication signal across the ocean. This was a huge step forward for humanity. About 20 years ago, connection speeds exceed 32 kbps, and the video began to surpass text as a major form of traffic, allowing us to communicate like never before. When the pandemic hit the world in 2020, connectivity once again reshaped how we live and work. Our social networking, entertainment, work, and education are no longer restricted by time and space. 
over the past year, we have received thousands of customer groups remotely in our exhibition hall in Shenzhen. In one moment, we may be discussing cutting-edge transmission technologies with customers from the Amazon region. And in the next moment, we may be introducing advanced home networking solutions to customers from the Sahara region. Connectivity is more than just an expansion of function. More importantly, it's an emotional bond. Thanks to the connectivity, more people who work far away from home can keep in touch with their loved ones. As long as there is connectivity, there is a bond. Connectivity is also accelerating the development of industries. Car makers no longer use real cars for collision simulation. Instead, they can do the simulation in a digital world, which is far more efficient. Enterprises in the manufacturing sector used to have a repeated R&D process based on real sample. But now, all of that work can be done in such a digital simulation. Connectivity is driving gains in enterprise productivity. Coal mining company today has three priorities. Ensuring safety, have fewer or even no workers underground, and increasing productivity. Safety is always the top priority. Our advanced fiber connectivity technology, once deployed underground, can precisely locate people and intelligently sensing the condition underground. This could help the rescue team save more lives. In a cold man, connectivity can make the difference between life and dies. In the digital age, people, things, capital, and regulation are fully connected. Enterprises have to change their mindset and realize that increasing efficiency is more important than ever. Where there is connectivity, there is innovation. Connectivity is changing the future. The world here and the real worlds are converging, creating a multi-dimension and a more diverse world. Thanks to your ongoing effort, connectivity is playing a greater role than ever. It presents with us unlimited possibilities. What should we do now? Stop moving or change the future? I believe it is our shared mission to create a connected world. 2021 opens a new chapter for connectivity. Despite the changes caused by the pandemic, we are still moving forward. The theme of 2020 Expo Dubai, Connecting Minds, Creating the Future, is an inspiration to us. We hope that at this year's Ultra Broadband Forum, we can jointly discuss how to create a connected world and make the world a better place. Thank you. Big thank you to Ryan Ding there for another brilliant presentation in which he articulately outlined how the real and virtual worlds are converging. And it is Huawei's shared mission to create a connected world. 
and now we're going to discuss how connectivity will drive new value and new growth. As we know, connectivity is expanding. At homes, connectivity is more than just text communication and video. It is about work, education, and trade. But more importantly, it is an emotional bond. For enterprises, connectivity is not just at the periphery, but at the very core of their production systems, which ultimately enables digital transformation. Connectivity is playing a greater role and presents us with unlimited possibilities, and it is also inspiring new business growth. Now it's time to hear from Pen Song. He is the president of the Carrier Business Group Marketing and Solutions Sales Department of Huawei, and he's going to give a, a presentation which is entitled Extend Connectivity, Drive Growth, which is the theme of today's Ultra Broadband Forum. Over to you, Ryan. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, both here and online, good morning. Welcome to the Ultra Broadband Forum 2021. The past year has been full of challenges and opportunities. Although the pandemic is not over yet, but the connectivity is bringing us here together. The 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games was the first ever Olympics with no live audience. But this did not dim the passion of the viewers from the world. They can still get a true to life experiences over the cloud. The Olympics Broadcasting Services live broadcast this event over the cloud to the world. And uh, they could, the data traffic of this, uh, of this event streaming was 72% uh, higher than that in Rio Olympics. This is another very important milestone in the digital revolution of the media industry. The pandemic has driven many governments to accelerate digitalization. In Dubai, for example, you now court notarization, contract signing, marriage registration can all be done online now and government services has become 50% faster and much more convenient for residents. During the pandemic, the con connectivity is not only the key to drive economy forward, but also the key to keep society functioning. This is why so many governments have made connectivity as the key part of new digital infrastructure and many operators also started to increase strategic uh, investment on connectivity. This is uh, the CAF model we presented last year in UBBF. And today I won't talk about many uh, technologies, products or solutions. I just want to share some industry practices to see how it can uh, maximize the value of connectivity to achieve the new growth. C stands for coverage. This is easy to understand. The broader coverage the network has, the more number of connections it will grow. It should also meet the changing demands of the connectiv connectivity from uh, households and enterprises for the new growth. F stands for fusion. A fusion between network and the cloud is key to speed up digitalization. As we all know that in this new decade, digitalization will continue to be one of the biggest opportunity for the whole ICT industry. So the earlier to achieve the network and cloud convergence, the better competition advantage that the telco operators can have. A stands for architecture. We all know that the network architecture is the cornerstone for present and future business success. A future-oriented network should be more efficient, more elastic, and greener. Now let's look at them in more details. 
Over the past year, home have become multiple functional centers. They are now centers for education, work, and trade. There are now 420 million students study online now. And also, there are more than 20 live streamers, which is 10 times more than that before the pandemic. In Hangzhou city from China, there is a building hosts 12,000 streamers. This is just a typical example for growing needs of bandwidth that we can see. Enterprises no longer focus just on bandwidth. For example, during the pandemic, Telecom Italia quickly set up the communication links for the temporary hospitals to provide remote treatment for thousands of patients. And the FAW, a car maker in China, they require 100 times more bandwidth when doing collision simulation. And such bandwidth elasticity has enabled them to increase the productivity by 25%. So enterprise connectivity is changing too. They are changing from the communication technology to an operational technology. As we can see, the great changes are happening. In order to seize all these opportunities, we need to extend our network coverage to more homes, more enterprises, and meet these new needs. Today, there are over 80% of the homes still have no fiber access. As we all know, the high deployment cost, long time to market, are still the key challenges to extend connectivity to home with fiber. First, more scientific planning methodology and tools are encouraged for the last mile fiber deployment. Globe from Philippines used Huawei full service fiber grid planning and a smart capex solution. And their fiber expenditure saved by 20% and greatly shortened its time to market. Of course, the innovative product and solutions can also help a lot. Huawei AirPon solution can reuse the sites and fiber resources and uh, the save the construction time greatly. Ross Telecom from Russia used the Huawei AirPon solution to provide coverage in the Arctic Circle, connecting 100 households within just two days. And Huawei's digital quick ODN solution does not need a fiber splicing, which normally requires highly skilled technicians. After using this solution, do from UAE. Shorten this time to market from months to just one week and reduce their capex by 30%. Now, once we get the broadband to home, the next step is to connecting every room in the house. Extending connectivity to every room will greatly increase the value of home broadband. Today, Orange, Buix, and AIS have already made Wi-Fi networking as the basic service of high-speed data plans. And this helps to retain their high-end users. Operators also need to improve their abilities to provide more value-added services. For example, China Telecom, for, they are providing the self-service management, auto network optimization services, and 50% of their new users have chosen this plan. And the FTTR, fiber to the room, represents the highest quality of the home broadband. In the past, operators only sold one ONT to each home, but now they can sell 10 ONTs to each home networks, and this will double their APU. And some operators started to provide scenario-based broadband package. For example, China Telecom offers a data package for streaming, 
and the output of this service has increased, you know, 550 yuan than ordinary plans. And 3BB from Thailand also provides a package for gaming. And the ARPU is also increasing by 10%. And all these cases prove that we can still get much more new value out of the home broadband. The top priority for this line is to provide differentiated offerings to keep this line competitive. And in addition to the basic bandwidth, operators can also provide different levels of latency and reliabilities, and they can also easily and flexibly combine these features and services to provide more differentiated offerings. For example, they can charge 10% higher price for fixed IP, and they can charge another 20% higher price for dedicated customer services. And besides the lease lines, enterprises also want better OT connectivities. This is the example. Huawei have deployed POL, passive optical LAN, at one of its factories. And the size of the equipment room and cabling reduced by 80%, and the network power consumption also cut by 50. DIP, deterministic IP, can also play a very important role in manufacturing industry. And uh, this will help Baoshan Iron and Steel Company to achieve remote control of machines with shorter latency while PLC was centralized. So if we can extend the connectivity from one to LAN, these lines will become private networks. And this is the new blue ocean for our telco operators. Fusion. Digitalization is no longer a concept. It is happening in many industries today. And we believe, as I mentioned earlier before, digitalization is one of the biggest opportunities in this new decade for the whole ICT industry. And no doubt, for sure, cloud is important for digitalization. But the connectivity is equally important, because without connectivity, even the mo most powerful cloud will need storage equipment that can only be transported by trucks. Without connectivity, the cloud will become nothing but a large data island. Also, the value of the cloud is determined by the network capabilities. According to the Cameroon Pace Group, from Avanta to Alita, there has been 120 times enhancement in the cloud-based rendering technologies. Unfortunately, our network capabilities has increased far less than 120 times. This is so-called short theory, short plate theory, and we cannot let network become the short board for digitalization. And we believe the telco operators can play a very important role in this because connectivity is what we are living for from the very beginning. When enterprises migrate to the cloud, during the process of digitalization, normally they will have three requirements. First is quick. Enterprises want to migrate to the cloud quickly, but the traditional lease line service provisioning is a slow process. And compared with uh, cloud agility, the network is not agile at all. So as a result, the lease lines are facing challenges from SD1s. With SRV6, China Telecom enables one-hop access to the cloud, and the services can be provisioned in minutes. And this solution can support agile access to the cloud and make lease lines more competitive. 
The second word is multiple. We all know that applications often deployed on different clouds. So the enterprises, they need to access to the multiple clouds, but most operators cannot provide multi-cloud access through a single connection. So that's why IXP providers are eating away market share by overlaying internet access. MTN Group, for example, has built a cloud backbone network across Africa, connecting 30 data centers from five different cloud providers. And this network can provide lower latency and better quality multi-cloud access than IXP networks. The third word is uh, deterministic. More and more enterprises started to migrate their core productivity system on the cloud, which requires both lens and ones to be deterministic. Different industries have different needs, for sure. Security is key in the healthcare sector, and the latency is critical in the finance industry. And the cloud-centric network slicing capabilities that China Telecom has built in Ningxia province for different industries has grown its revenue by 150%. So if we can meet one of these three requirements, then we will have much more new space to grow. Besides the network and the cloud, the industry application ecosystem is also important to speed up the digitalization. A cloud network converged platform is needed for its user and the industry partner to easily invoke network and cloud capabilities. Operators can also integrate network cloud and application services in one-stop service for its enterprise users. And China Unicom has launched such one-stop service computing platform. And it provides SMEs with network, cloud, and SaaS services. And this platform has already hosts more than 50 SaaS service providers and offers cloud office, cloud rendering, and security application services, etc. The operator that taking 20% of each SaaS service sale on this platform. This is what I usually say. The more you can do, the more flexible business model you can have. Architecture. I mentioned this earlier before. Network is important. Network is the foundation. Architecture is the cornerstone for the current and the future business success. First, it should be elastic. You can build an all optical foundation to bring fiber to everywhere with an OTN and a more optical cross connects. And a span leaf architecture can enable more scalability for a data center centric network. And SRV6 deployed over the entire network can ensure end to end network slicing. And uh, we also need to make our network services greener. In access network, we are shifting from copper to optical. And the PON technologies can save the power by 65%. In a transport network, operators are deploying more and more OXCs, optical cross connects, which can save the whole network power consumption by half. Furthermore, data generated in cities can be transported to the remote data center through optical and IP networks so that the data center could be greener too. Also, we also can define, redefine the OPEX once autonomous driving was introduced to our network. This will bring two major changes. First, operation and maintenance will be automated, 
resources can be visualized and essentially scheduled. And the faults will be automatically fixed. For example, in a data center network, there are seven types of common faults which can be detected in one minute, located in three minutes, and fixed in five minutes. And also, the scenario-based API can open to your user. For example, China Unicom's users. They can check their network performance on their own. They can adjust their network bandwidth on their own. Through an uh, APP, which is called SmartLink, provided by the operator. And this service increased the China Unicom's revenue by 300,000 yuan per month. The amount is not that big, but uh, really, I believe this is a quite successful practice in our industry. In conclusion, I would like to draw your attention back to my point. There are huge opportunities for connectivity. And it is key for our telco operator to build your network competitiveness based on the CAF model, coverage, fusion, and architecture. This is an Arabic saying, actions are fruits, while words are but leaves. On behalf of, of Huawei, I would like to thank you all for coming today. And uh, I know we are still facing the harsh environment, but uh, we will continue to innovate on the connectivity technologies. And we will continue to play our part and to support our customers to achieve continuous business success. Once again, thank you very much. A big thank you to Peng Song there for another brilliant presentation and for giving us a detailed insight into the CEF model, which he believes will pave the way forward. As we know, the ongoing pandemic has changed the way we live, the, the way we work, and the way we learn, and that has changed the makeup of our society. However, we can see and we know that the implementation of fixed network infrastructure has played a he huge role in our recovery. The better the fixed network infrastructure, the better the quantity and quality of connections. And of course, that leads to better experiences. And we know that we live in the new experience economy. Now it's time to hear from Mr. Bokar Ba, CEO and board member of Samina, to share with us their findings and their thoughts about investing in fixed network infrastructure to promote regional digital economic development. Please welcome Mr. Bokar Ba. Excellencies, private, private and public sector leaders, industry colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. I am deeply honored to be a part of this exceptional event which corroborates the need to accelerate broadband to new frontiers as we have seen this morning with my previous colleagues. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Huawei UBBF team for this excellent organization. This uh, ultra broadband forum represents great opportunities for the stakeholders in the digital value chain to communicate and cooperate in order to build a sustainable ecosystem for the ultra broadband industry and this forum is in perfect harmony with the spirit of the broadband commission's agenda for action 
It's my privilege to be among the commissioners of the Broadband Commission, all of whom have committed their efforts to help implement this agenda for action and to invite all industry stakeholders present here and remotely to fully leverage the power of broadband for a faster economic recovery and for creating also new opportunities and for achieving together beneficial utilization of innovation in broadband. Now this subject today, I would like to say here that as time has truly changed, sustainable development is driving, is the driving catalyst, a hope for a more inclusive and equitable future for us and our future generations to come. Advanced ICT infrastructure and other digital technologies are now vital to normal functioning of our lives and businesses and next generation networks and cloud communication are the new enablers. At the same time, we are seeing inclusion and economic well-being in the new digital light and we are learning to readjust our priorities to fill, as Doreen this morning was mentioning, key gaps, whether such gaps are at the policy or regulatory level, gaps at an investment level, gaps at a corporation level, or at the level of incubating new ideas to foster innovation. And building the digital economy is recognizably a major global imperative. Innovation in mobile and broadband access, cloud computing, cloud communication, and progress to the next version of internet protocol, all of which are necessary for making the most beneficial use of the internet that lie at the heart of how the economy needs to grow, and this digitally. Ladies and gentlemen, we as a society and our telecom networks as pillar of advanced communications are moving toward greater intelligence, more perception and automation, and materializing gigabyte society is a milestone in this regard. Over the next few years, as we achieve this milestone, leveraging the power of both infrastructure, including physical and cloud infrastructure, and new capabilities offered by artificial intelligence, our objective is to create impact beyond just having a simple internet. Our aim is also to create an intelligent world that the theme, the theme of today's discussion, a world built on enhanced connectivity, which in turn demand extensive availability of digital infrastructure, whether it's fiber or cloud, and it requires as well extensive digital space for supporting the billions of connections that are happening before our eyes, and I'm referring to the migration from IPv4 to IPv6 and IPv6+. In a digital world, ultra-broadband networks are the most important infrastructure for communities and businesses, and it is fixed line, as we have heard again, my colleagues, fiber network as well as intelligent cloud-based capabilities, leveraging the power of IPv6 and the new cloud business models as well, that will provide somehow the foundation for our society to thrive in the, digital, in the digitally dr uh, driven future. Moreover, we can add that in the digital world because every intelligent connection requires an IP address, it is only through IPv6 that we will be able to solve the IP address shortage forever for realizing that digitally driven future. Our intelligent world starts with ultra broadband and by ultra, we don't just mean ultra low latency, ultra high bandwidth and data transmission rates and massive connection. In fact, we are referring to the enablement of 5G transport, Internet of Things, IoT, data center interconnects, 
enterprise cloud application, the rendition of virtual reality content through fast and stable transport network, and importantly, lower consumption of energy resources, which in itself is among the major challenges that we are contending with in the context of sustainable development. We are at a stage in our technological evolution where connectivity must coincide well with cloud and catalyze a multi-layer wave of digitalization across all industry uh, adjacent sectors, digital economies at large. And this crucially requires the participation and contribution of the enterprise sector. And this is where I must mention the importance of fiber together and IPv6 based network and enterprise cloudification. Of course, I will be addressing the policy and regulatory issues. Even before, if you remember the grueling effect of the year 2020 uh, last year when it happened, enterprise cloudification was deemed a major pillar of economic growth. However, just as the role of state-of-the-art ICT infrastructure came to limelight, so did the need for greater enablement of enterprise sector through right policies, right technologies, and right level of participation, of course, and an assured sustainability. Recognizing that the internet is the lifeblood of digital economy, fiber plus IPv6-based broadband network are necessary investment to make in order to improve the pace of growth and inclusiveness of our regional digital economy. Colleagues, we are here today because we believe in the benefits extending connectivity can achieve in terms of driving overall growth. As our societies and the global digital economy uh, digitalize, there are even more possibilities to advance standards of living through human-centric, data-driven, and evidence-based policies, increased economic competitiveness, higher uh, quality jobs, enhanced provisions of public services throughout the entire Samina, South Asia, Middle East, and North Africa regions, the urban and rural communities. For that, we need to advance the necessary fixed line infrastructure and leverage the power of fiber itself, IPv6, unlock access to new capital and funding and new ways of sharing that is important responsibilities to develop that infrastructure and develop as well, importantly, human capital investment for the digital age create awareness that is also important at every level and the relevance to proliferate meaningful digital services and ensure everyone can afford. Affordability is an important pillar for broadband connectivity and of course the quality of service for the network. And the larger interest of the region's socio-economic empowerment goals, we need that is fundamental to align our priorities and program together to move together in a sync. Understanding that the inherent nature of the digital economy demands participation, concerted efforts, and unified regional wide and worldwide responses to tackle the connectivity gaps and to ensure that huge challenges like the digital divide are overcome. Just so that we are aligned to my opinion, digital divides means three categories of divides, and I would like to elaborate a bit more on that. The divide between developed nation and developing nation of the region, this is where, as part of the sustainable development agenda, the goal is to connect the remaining 46% of the world population, 3.7 billion people, most of which resides in the developing nation. The second gap is the divide between affluent communities within a country versus 
poor communities or household. This substantiates the need for accelerated deployment of fiber and IPv6 based network in the remote and rural areas. The third divide between population segment, where, uh, which is where digital literacy and capacity building for all comes into play. As we know, the cause of digital divide can be many. And when we look at the hard and soft factors, just to keep in our mind, the first cause is socio-economic class structure. The second one, geographical and demographical factors. Third one, language barrier, which is very important to create that divide. The first one, the lack of relevant content for the rural population. Fifth, the low level of education in traditional fields such as science, math, among the younger population of the region. Lack of digital literacy and insufficient promotion of the relevance of digital capacity building among the elder citizens. And the last one, which is right in front of us in many of those developing nations, insufficient telecom and electricity infrastructure overall. So when we talk about digital divide, it's important to identify the causes, but also to list the type of gaps that create that famous uh, divide to be able to achieve the connecting 3.7 billion people. Of course, how to overcome the digital divide, as I just mentioned, we absolutely require ICT infrastructure that is reliable and can support the data demand, the data tsunami that we will be facing over the coming decades of both, not only the people, but also machines. And for that, we need new financial resources. The way we bring access to connectivity must take into account the technological progress we have made as an industry with partners, and thank you Huawei partners like Huawei who have made a tremendous contribution to make connectivity possible in new innovative ways. With also the change societal, technological, market uh, realities, market dynamics, uh, the investment in the new infrastructure can no longer follow the same approaches that got us this far today. The issue of uh, digital divide demand, fifth generation approach, just as our technological progress demand fifth generation collaboration. New approaches in building infrastructure would greatly benefit by being aligned with the change characteristic of broadband, which is now, and we can say it, as a basic human right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, leaders and experts, 2021 onwards, our collective action and ambitions must work in sync as we endeavor to operate and develop sustainably this new digital era. Achieving targets we have defined, such as the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we are only nine years uh, away from 2030, nine years, more years to fulfill them. That will depend on our commitment to our common responsibility to collaborate, to partner, to develop a more inclusive and sustainable society operating, of course, on reliable, resilient networks as we have seen during the pandemic. I will not come back on the uh, presentation that I made here itself last, uh, last week on the 21st century financing models. That is an information which is available. So we see that as more people and things go online, continued investment in communication network is needed to ensure that connection and transfer of data between connected devices can take place very quickly. Thus, use of uh, fiber and IPv6 in fixed network and cloudification must be achieved to support 
increases in speed and capacity across all next generation technologies. Generation to generate strong value from fixed fiber plus IPv6 network is the goal here of our discussion and fixed network do the heavy work even with respect to the increasing demand placed on wireless network. Therefore, investment in next generation communication networks by harnessing the power of fiber and IPv6 is critical. We need to bring uh, fiber physically closer to the end user, whether a business or a resident, internet speed increases across all technologies, even when the final connection are made using non-fiber media. With high reliability of speeds and having IPv6 enhanced innovation, and uh, we will discuss it tomorrow in the address IPv6+, plus, on every end user device, IoT or cloud services, beyond the mass address space, quality of digital experience can be improved ac across all the services. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, to extend connectivity and drive growth, it is essential for the industry to keep in mind, I summarize it into three points. Number one, to establish a baseline for universal digital connectivity, especially in view of the gigabyte milestone that we aim to achieve as a society. Number two, identify and support public-private financing of universal broadband, pioneering somehow innovative hybrid or complementary and replicable and sustainable financing and investment models for all type of networks, technology neutral and catalyzing impactful partnership. The third one, Advocate, advocacy is extremely important, awareness for enabling ICT regulatory environment, ICT capacity building, and online, we have not discussed that, online safety and security, especially for the children. The whole planet, schools are connected online. We have a big issue on child online protection. And sustainable, of course, as integral to efforts to achieve the Global Broadband Target 2025 and the Sustainable Development Goals. As we uh, unlock new capital and forge new alliances to meet common objectives that both private sector and government share, it is crucial that from the private sector standpoint, they should be provided with the necessary collaborative support, and key area of regulation and policies must be revisited with regard to accelerating deployment of fiber. We have major impediment for right of ways and many examples for accelerating fiber deployment and the transition to IPv6 and of course to IPv6 plus. Regional economies need to realize their digital transformation on time and be on the path to sustainable digital economic development in which ultra-broadband networks have a central role to play. With this, just wanted to share with you my thought. I would like to thank you very much for having this conversation and I wish you a successful UVBF. Looking forward to see you tomorrow afternoon for the closing of the ceremony at the address uh, Skyview. Thank you very much. Thanks to Bokar Ba there for outlining how the large-scale deployment of IPv6 and fiber will guarantee an IP address for everyone, as well as accelerating the digital transformation across various industries. The pandemic, as we already know, has been accelerating the digitalization of products and services for nearly two years. And according to research 
recently compiled by McKinsey, they have claimed that the global digitalization process is seven years ahead of schedule. Under this new wave of digital transformation, the question must be asked, how can connections extend into the cloud, and how can cloud networks provide intelligence and computing power to industries and individuals in the digital economy? To hear more, now let's invite Mr. Kevin Hu, President of Huawei's data communication product line to give us a keynote speech which is entitled Intelligent Cloud Network Inspiring New Growth. Please welcome Kevin onto the stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all friends, so I'm very excited to join the UBBF uh, in Dubai. So actually, the day before yesterday, I joined the GitHub. So it's amazing. This is my first time, you know, joining GitHub. So many people, they focus on the ICT solution. They focus on how to connect the cloud. So today, I will share the Huawei solution, how to build in the future proof and the architecture to support the growth in the future. So first of all, you know, the three questions today I will share. So what is the opportunities for us in the future? So some operators, they still focus on the path. So more fiber, more radio access. This is one kind of strategy. Another, they focus on, you know, so how to digitalize the billing systems, operating systems, but still focus on the operation to improve the efficiency. So today, what's the opportunities? The second one, so if you design your strategy, but how can you seize the opportunities? You must change something, right? So you must to shorten you know, the gap between the future with you know, the, you know, today, the install-based network, how to migrate to the future, right? The last one is, you know, what's the approach? How to catch the opportunities? So digitalization, so no doubt, is the future, right? This is the fourth revolution, industry revolution. So digitalization, so uh, economics is growing faster than GDP. So many countries, so 50 countries, they release the digital strategies already, right? So in China, so now uh, the digital economics is, is 38 in a percentage. So by 25, the percentage will improve to 53. So this is the big potential. So everybody focus on this. And then, so we can, we can see this is architecture. So in the middle is the operator's network. So if you focus on the access for the fiber, so this is coverage, is very important, no doubt. But you know, the key point is the speed. So I discuss the key problem with many operators. So the most challenging thing is speed. So who is your competitor today? Not the operator in local country, no. It's OTT players. So the OTT player, so he is worldwide service provisioning systems. He can cover it more than 100 countries. If you still focus on you know, the local competitors, no way, right? But how you can against? Sometimes it's against, sometimes is partner cooperating with the OTT players. OTT players is just part of you know this digital you know service provider. So the government, the fintech company, so they are also you know digital you know business providers. So how can you build in a multi-class solution? So this is the new. So MDC is very popular. So in past you know ten years, so everybody took about the data center-centric network architecture. But uh, how? 
is just you know centralize the data centers and then modelize the data centers as finished? I think this is the wrong way. So if you build in just a data center, you cannot speed up your speech. The speed, the agility is the key today. So there, there's some, you know, the, the fintech companies, the no way. They just, you know, select SD1. Why? SD1 is faster than underlay network, right? So this is the problem. So you can see, you know, they, they, from the cloud side, this is, you know, their transfer from office system to production. You know, production system is meaning critical mission system. Can you guarantee zero packet loss? Can you provide it a deterministic connectivity? Now, this is the requirement. It's, it's there, but can you provide it, right? So from the connectivity, you also can see, you know, the agility provisioning. So some customers, you know, face big challenges. Today, just one branch office connect to cloud. So the typical time, it will take weeks, sometimes take months. Why? So in the branch office, it's private address, just IPv4. It's private. So if you see from the cloud, so the IP address as a fun conflict is the same. So 10.110.0.1 is the same conflict. And the second thing is from the branch office to the cloud. So sometimes use you know 10 hops. If you use MPS technology, how to config one by one. So it's very, very slow. Uh, very, very slow. Another one is experience. So can you guarantee, you know, the dedicate the virtual network? Sometimes it's not just, you know, shell QS, hierarchy QS, no. It looks like, you know, like a virtualized fiber. It's dedicated for them. So this is the requirement. Uh, so if you can do this, so the right side you can see in China market, so the, the DSD service, the digital plus SD service is three trillion yeah. RMB. It's very huge. But the operators just, uh, you know, engage the CT communication service. It's just, you know, 50% like this. But how can you, you know, engage the business? So we analyze if the operators that provided, you know, the digital service, they can, you know, Enlarge the scope, you know, from 500 billion to 800 billion. So this is the opportunities. But how to catch the opportunities? So <clears throat> the four barriers for you to reach this goal, with this category. First of all is the capability. So many people just focus on the, the super, you know, data center. More than 10,000 or 100,000, you know, servers. Okay, share. I think this is just part of, you know, the strategy. So the edge is more important than the central. So edge is meaning your capability, your infrastructure capability. But how can you Get more, you know, the equipment room. This is a challenge. Because of the edge, is very smaller. Uh, just the 20 square meters. The second one is can, how can you provide it, the different AT experience assurance to support the production system. This is new. So the office or consumer business, most of them the email or web like this. This is not time intensive. But for production, the, you will sign the contract with your customer. If you cannot reach the SRA, their penalty are waiting for you. So this is different. Uh, the third one is how to realize the network demand. Why? Because of you know, the digital service is elective system. It's sick out. Sometimes you know, they increase the capacity more than 10 times just one hour. 
This is their requirement. The fourth one is how to achieve the optimal resource utilization. So many operators say, so hi, Kevin, I'm just building a network. But usually, the usage is just more than 30%, right? But sometimes, the traffic is growing burst and cannot control the network. This is the problem. So for us, you know, this time we will launch the new solution, the so four points, four features. So all services to support you building super, super edge CEO. So edge is the feature. The second one is talent level, hard slicing. So talent is a common language for cloud. It's meaning talent is your users. You must support multi-talent management. The third one, it is the SRV6 powered network programmability. So if you just focus on the, you know, the cloud, the orchestrator, this is also, you know, programmability. But SRV6 is very useful. So you can build in the software chain. You can define the service chain. This is new. The last one is cloud network integration. Some people, you know, know this, right? Cloud network, cloud plus network, cloud collaborate with network, cloud integrate with network. This is different level. So first of all, this is the super edge, then, you know, solution. So because of, you know, the, the, the equipment room is very, very small. So Huawei let engine A out in the M series. This is compact design, can integrate with 300 millimeters, you know, depths, you know, box. But the capability is huge. Can support more than two terabit capacity. And it's 2.5 times the others. The second one is four rate rate port. There's some customers say, so the capacity is not so big. We also support the so one gig to 400 gig net. This is amazing. Huh? So no matter, you know, the customer, you just buy one platform and support, you know, 10 years long-term illusion. The third one is we support broadband service. We also support backhauling. We support enterprise, support SRV6, just one box. This is very popular in the industry. And what's benefit for you? So one CEO can access a uh, very compact design. So more than 128,000 broadband subscri subscriber and 10,000 you know, enterprise access and 100 you know, the mobile you know, radio station. So TCO, you know, saving dramatically. You can save the, the room space. You can save the power. So the second one is very interesting, you know, feature. We say hot slicing. You know, for IP network, for internet, it's best effort. You know, the show, the, you know, the, the bandwidth, it looks like, you know, the, the road. It's dot line, right? So you can change your direction. You can share the rotors. But now, today, we introduce new technology. You know, depend on the Ethernet layer. We don't change the IP layer. We just change Ethernet layer, right? So this technology can, you know, say, OK, this is, you can draw from dot line to real line. OK, it looks like a watcher, you know, watcher wall between the lane. This is new technology, right? So the requirement is, if you provided a network to connect with the cloud, the enterprise business is they're very uh, sensitive. So many customers say, OK, my, my customer, they are more than you know, 10 departments. Each department emphasizes my requirement is different. I need to separate you know, the network. So usually, you're just building one department, one fiber, 10 department, 10 fiber. This is traditional way, right? But now we support, you know, the slicing. Slicing technology, you, in the middle, you can see just one box can, you know, support, you know, six fiber. 
in the user side, and the uplink is just one fiber. But we support you know, the virtual technology, slicing. And then what's the benefit for you? So you can you know, use one fiber to bond in one customer, and then to the cloud. So this is extend your business scope. And it's better, right? It's easier. So actually, we had deployed you know, in some operators. So all the customers, they, you know, they are very, very interesting about you know, slicing technology. They use this slicing network. So you also know, you know the 5G, about you know, 5G slicing, right? The core network slicing. So what's the highlight from Huawei? You know, this is, first one is Flex Ethernet you know, to support deterministic network. So if you deploy the hardware, hard slicing, so if the traffic is smaller, it's then the bandwidth. So it's amazing. The, the packet loss is zero. The jitter is zero. This is amazing. The second one is we can support more than 1,000 service and application hierarchy, you know, slicing. It's meaning just one fiber. Looks like 1,000 virtual fiber. The third one is automation, not lossless. Uh, bandwidth adjustment, with minutes. It's meaning the slicing, you can change in minutes. If the customer, you know, traffic is elastic, you can change in nine minutes. That's different. You, you know, it's a, the road. You know, there's congestion. Okay, so you can define and control a real line in minutes, and you can guarantee the service. Some critical mission service. This is new. So the third one is SRV6 based network programmability. So many operators that say, you know, SRV6 is not matured, they're waiting for the vendors. But today, today, SRV6 is ready. You can fulfill. So actually, we had, we had deployed more than 100 real network. There's some interesting scenarios. So for the enterprise customer, especially for the fintech companies, they had deployed SRV6 two years ago already, no doubt. Uh, they don't do inability. He say, Kevin, I enjoy this technology. Why? So we are waiting for SDN technology long term. So SDN use in data center very fast. SDN VX line is matured. But for one network, for Metro, for Backbone, no SD1. No SDN technology. So why you lost SD1? So when you sales computer against with ODT, so that's SD1 is okay, right? Because of you don't deploy SDN in your network. But if you introduce SDN controller, but how can you support an SDN? Is open flow? No way. So open flow will you know destroy the re resilience of internet. So the internet is distrib distributed network architecture. But you deploy a SDN controller. So if the SDN controller is done, so what's the impact of your network? So everybody know Facebook SDN, right? The SDN is done, the DNS is done, and more than 2 billion users service is done. So this is a disaster. So we you know, investigate these scenarios more than two years, three years. So we found the SDN plus SRV6 is the best way for you to support the SDN. And then you can improve your speed, your speed very, very fast. So why? So the agility is the key for the future. If you want to win the competition between you and the OTT player, or between you and the lane network and overlay network, so can we improve the speed of underlying network? This is the key. So 
what's our solution? The left side is NPS network, so NPS. So actually, 2018, when I joined the NPS forum in Paris three years ago, I say, no NPS anymore. So many people say, Kevin, you big mouth. No, I don't believe. MPS still there, right? The three years passed. So we don't, do, we don't say MPS anymore. Why? MPS is good. But if you connect to the cloud, it's a disaster. Why? So MPS you know, network is very complex. So this you know, domain connect to another domain is so complex. They're influenced by each other. But the cloud is software. If you, the cloud, is develops, it's depend on the software, you know, very fast. But your network is depend, depend on the engineer that configure this. So this is a joke, right? Your speed is depend on the engineers, you know, professional skills, right? So, but we can do. So we upgrade, you not know, to IPv6 stack. So IPv6. It's maturity more than 15 years ago, but it's just defined the IP address. A new stack, new you know protocol is there. So we say SRV6. So this is IP native. It's just a seamless. So in the middle, you know, side, you don't need really config. You just config, you know, the the source and the destination, and then it's okay, right? So this is SRV6. Policy. The policy is meaning the IP network is still distributed, but so you can you know install the controller and can optimize the network. This is global view. The traditional IP network is just you know uh, part you know optimized, but now it's global optimization. The second one is service chain. Service chain is very very useful. Because of, you know, today, more and more branch office, they connect to the cloud. SME is very, very hot. The business is growing more than 100%. But the service is very, very rich, such as security, connectivity, computing. So how can you, you know, provide a programmability to support the software chain? SFV6 can do this, right? So, the, the fourth one, it is cloud network integration. It's meaning, you know, multi-clouds. So, code of, you know, for the OTT players, for the cloud providers, the uh, challenge is how can that support multi-lines, right? Just the one cloud collect multi-operators. But for operator, how can you support multi-clouds? So why? So because of today, especially for healthcare you know, sector, the uh, you know, traffic model it is multi-cloud. So if you just provided you know, the, the south north traffic model, so the application is very hard, right? They access many times to different you know, cloud. But the model should like this, the south north, and then the east west, this is the best way. So if you want to build in you know, the, the east west model, you must support you know, the multi clouds, the interconnect. So this is a look like DCI. This is cloud backbone network. So Huawei you know, NCE, this is our, you know, our software platform to support the controller, to support you know, big data analytic systems. So can support, you know, the, you know, the, the loss bound to integrate it with you, uh, the surface model. The second is digital twins. You know, we real time, you know, surface map. So we can support the digitalized network, the big data, you know, driven. The second one is source bound. Source bound, many customers focus on, can you manage the vendor, the other vendor's equipment? So we support already. So this is the, the differentiation between the you know, traditional model. The tradition is Sino. It's just you know, uh, you know, focus on the box, hardware, port, nugs, alarm, like this. You manage 
the box, you manage the connectivity. But today, the NC platform, they can you know, provide the day level provisioning, automation platform. The second is real-time uh, visualization. This is very important. So traditionally, you just deploy probe to detect the quality, latency, gesture, or traffic like this. But this is outbound, very expensive. So today, our support, you know, the inflow, the IP test, telemetry technology already. So we support telemetry. You can detect the quality of pole flow and then support the visualization. The last one is model. So we support, you know, BSID. We support, you know, the, the, you know, the seed model. This is based on SRE6. So we can reduce the interface, you know, between you OSS with the, 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 the hardware, you know, chassis, more than, save more than 90%. It's very easy. You just define the model. It's okay. So this is our solution, you know. Uh, uh, this, so uh, I just, uh, you know, show the from the edge to the backbone network. But this is just a part of. If you want to involve, engage, you know, the manage LAN or managed security service. So Huawei also provided, you know, see. Uh, we provided the Wi-Fi 6, very powerful, many customers use. Uh, in the middle is the, the, the campus, you know, switch for the campus scenarios. Then last one, we also support SD1 box. The SD1 box support, you know, 5G plus SRV6 already, very powerful. So the best way to against your competitor is you can also, you know, provide the same weapon, right? So. The data center is also important, right? Data center is the key, right? Many customers, you know, that deploy, you know, the 100, you know, thousand, you know, servers every year. But today, you know, the data center is silo. So such as, you know, storage network, high performance computing, and, the, you know, the common computing in, in infrastructure. So today, so we, uh, you know, support all the, all the service currently over Ethernet. Just the one network. So this is the, the unique vendor can provide this. So because of we introduce the AI empowered traffic management. So can achieve to zero packet loss over Ethernet. So everybody knows this. Ethernet, zero packet loss is amazing. Uh, no way, right? But we do the support. So this is, you know, the uh, how say the, this is the ecosystem, right? So IPv6. Is there? So what's the meaning of IPv6 plus? So we can say IPv7 or IPv8 because IPv6 is there. But IPv6, so should plus something, should develop. So we say automation, security, uh, latency, connectivity, and that deterministics. Some guys say, wait, hi, Kevin, internet is there. So can you change? So internet is decoupling. You just folks, the connectivity is okay. I agree. But this scenario, it is focused on the, the backbone of internet among the countries. So if the internet is you know, close to the users, to the edge, you must enhance the connectivity. So such as you know, IET, 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 IETF, so ETSI, or China CCC, all the standard organization that focus on this, how to develop. So in the middle, this is the protocol stack. So such as multicast, such as, you know, I fit, you know, telemetry technology, so developing very fast. Because of today, today, IPv4 standard is frozen, low development. So American, China, Europe, they are developing IPv6 very, very fast. 
So the right side, you know, this is Huawei, you know, uh, uh, cases. So we had deployed more than 100 commercial customers already. So many kind of government, fintech, operators. So, so some people, you know, focus on the efficiency, SRV6, IPv6. But the SRV6 also support, you know, the compress technology already, right? So summarize, today, I just share the challenges for the digitalization. I also share our suggestion, how to approach the future, how to seize the opportunities, the four things. The first, you improve your capability of the network. So we say super edge is the key. The second one is the talent ever slicing to support the critical mission business. The third one is SRV6 support pro programmability and just one hop from the edge to the cloud. Improve your speed, speed. The last one is cloud network integration support multi clouds. So thanks very much. A big thank you to Kevin Hu once again there for another excellent presentation. Huawei believe that their intelligent cloud network solution can really help operators build a high quality connectivity foundation for the digital economy and achieve sustainable business growth. Okay, so remaining on the topic of connectivity, what is the most important event uh, of this year in the Middle East region? It is, of course, Expo 2020, which has been labeled the most connected site on Earth. As uh, the Expo 2020's official telecommunications and digital services premier partner, Edislat Group is a world-class telecom operator with a leading network that delivers unrivaled customer experience for their users. At today's UBBF, we are honored and absolutely delighted to invite Mr. Zaid al Saruni, the network SVP of Edislat UAE, to decode their strategy and outline their latest innovations in the ultra broadband field of Edislat. Please welcome on stage Saeed Al Saruni. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My honor and my pleasure that all of you. Welcome to Dubai after, I think, uh, a very tough year last year since the uh, pandemic starts. Uh, I prepared some slides, but uh, my aim that the slide, I will go through them very, very fast, and you can get some information from the slides. But uh, I want to, I'd like to share my, our Tisarat experience during the pandemic and what lesson learned from the pandemic and how to move forward after, uh, let's say, the tough time that, that we passed through. And I will take this opportunity also to appreciate and thank all the engineers. Our engineers, they work on field during the pandemic. I think we are all proud to be part of the sector that we support the humanity during the pandemic and all of us to work hard to keep our connectivity, our customer connected all uh, uh, 24 by 7 without any interruption. Um, just to start with a small story that when we start or the pandemic starts, before that we, are, we think about connectivity. Yeah. All the engineers sitting behind the screens, their target is to how to keep this connectivity up and running. But I think the case we learn after the pandemic, that is not only the connectivity, it's the experience. And also we learned that at the end we, we went to the home. So everybody was at his home. He's joining multiple or different uh, 
services that we provide, but the connectivity was enough to support all the massive connection uh, serving the remote working, serving the distance learning. And you know that, that in, in country that the family members, around five or six family members at home, all of them connected. Are they enjoying the service or only we are connecting them without any, let's say, monitoring? If we go back in 2008, when our government, they push toward the smart government that how to transform the government to be more smart. So we, as an operator, we have to think, are we digitized? Are we are a fully automated network? And unfortunately, it was not. So in 2018, we started building our software factory within Etisarat. We believe that to be transformed, to be fully digitized and fully automated, we can't rely on partners only. And we work with Huawei, with other partners together to improve our networks over years. But I think we have to rely on our people also. Our people, our organization, that the engineers, they know exactly what is our pain, how to improve the customer experience. But we build a software factory within Etisarat, across all domains, to start a digital transformation journey. If we talk about digital transformation journey, it's not a traditional monitoring. That when we start, I think, five or six years back, we talk about customer-centric that. The operator came with a sort of uh, service operating center. But the service operating center it was only monitoring the KPI, what customer experience, that's it. How to be more smart, how to take it to the next step. This to require to build a, back, a huge background logic building on algorithm that we feel how, how the customer pains that can be taken to the next level. Uh, sorry to take more, a long introduction, but we'll go th uh, through that, the drivers be for the Salat to support the society. Definitely that all the f four, um, uh, let's say, drivers here is connected together. And the main that just now the talks about agility, how to be more agile, how to be more efficient, and how to provide the best customer experience, all of this cannot be, uh, let's say, delivered the, without an, a fully automated network and fully digitized. And when I'm saying automated, it should be smartly automated. It will be built on the artificial intelligence. It should be built on the machine learning and data scientists. That should be based on a platform that you build it together with a partner to cover all your pains, the customer pains, how to improve your, the customer experience. So this is actually the enablers for the, for the network, how to build the smart cities, how to enhance the customer experience. If we talk about the infrastructure, your infrastructure should be ready. And when I talk about infrastructure, we're covering a mobility, we're covering an, a fixed networks, fiber to the home, fiber to the enterprise uh, and business customers. It should be ready, zero touch networks, humanless network that, and by the way, just now I wanted to, to announce that our 5G networks, when we start, and now an Expo 2020 is a showcase that there is a human, new human monitoring the Expo 2020. All the network changes and optimizations, it's running now automatically, fully digitized and automated. Now when I'm talking, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of commands running on the networks on Expo 2020 to make sure that it's more efficient, the resource is balanced between the sites and the best services provided to the customers. AI-based services is very critical. When we talk about AI, we talk about predictivity. That's mean before the incidents happen, before customers start complaining, we have to predict that and we have to act fast. And we talk about AI, it will be connected to a self-healing also. So it's a predict and correct before customers start 
uh, complainings or raising uh, an issue on the network. So this slide will give you only a high level of uh, Tisala to be leading networks from the FTTH penetration that nine, more than 98% we are, uh, the FTTH's penetration we are reaching now, and I think it will be growing. We created with a pandemic another program because still we have around 2% of our customers not covered by the FTTH. So we, call, we created a, a program called National Broadband. So to ensure that all the customers in UAE, despite they are in, in the sea or in the desert or in the, any part of the UAE, it will be covered. So national Broadband will be, depends on the three pillar, which is an FTTH and the, fi, uh, the wireless connectivity, which is the 5G connectivity. And the 4G connectivity depends on the number of users in that area. Also, about the 5G, when we start the 5G uh, rollout starting from 2018, uh, now we are reaching more than, I think, my, also our partners or uh, colleagues from DO, they announced around 90% of our network or the population uh, the cities has been covered by the 5G. 5G network. We ensure that the connectivity, 5G is a backhaul. So base, we uh, uh, work on that to ensure that all the connectivity of the 5G is reaching 10 gig. So now we have 10 gig per site. All the 5G sites is connected over 10 gig. And the 4G, it's uh, 1 gig per site to support the four carrier aggregation that we have here. And currently, we are, we are reaching around 415 BPS on the 4G. And I think on Expo, we reached three gigabit per second that we announced uh, recently uh, uh, with our partners in Expo. And everybody knows that uh, as per the Okla speed test, Salat has been announced as the fa fastest network on Earth. And this is all built on the, let's say, the, the infrastructure that we, uh, we have built over years. Uh, if we go, go now to the, to the to the home that we need to focus on as, uh, uh, let's say that uh, 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 listen learn from the, from the pandemic that how to, how to enhance the experience at home from to be a connection focus to experience focus, how to uh, inject sort of the intelligent networks within the home, the reachability though, that even though I'm, I'm reaching to the home with a wing gig, still I'm receiving a, a complaints from customers. During the pandemic, 80% of the complaints were received from customers, it's within their premises. Because within the premises, it's out of operator control. We are up to the ONT device that installed in the customer. Beyond that, it is a customer, uh, let's say, control that area. We don't know exactly what's happening. We need to extend that to uh, uh, cover a single room within, within the customer to ensure that he's enjoying the, the services. For transforming the home experience, it depends on the different uh, uh, factors that we are work, how to enhance the smart living by introducing new solutions within the customer premises. Uh, first called resolution, we work on, on it, and now we are reaching around 90% uh, of first call uh, get uh, resolved uh, uh, from uh, within a, sh a very very fast uh, time. Uh, smart TV solution, a new user experience that we are evolving the, our smart TV solutions to, uh, to the uh, to the latest uh, technology. A new device management that the point I just talked that how to manage the devices within the home that we are focusing on. To, to cover all the rooms without the, uh, within the, the, the customer uh, home or the, let's say the enterprise segment. Modernize the last mile. This is an ongoing journey and I think all the operators should not stop modernizing the last mile, uh, which is a very important to ensure the latest technology is delivered and uh, the, the fast, uh, fastest, uh, let's say, uh, solutions became, it's, it's like, uh, a uh, base for, for, for any solution that you will be offering to the customers 
uh, at home or at uh, uh, his uh, business premises. Proactively resolution that using the data and analytics that we have it, and we build, as I mentioned, that a platform within it, Salat, crossing all the domains to proactively detect and correct any fault received uh, uh, from home, uh, from uh, mobile site, from the network, across all domains. It has been already uh, developed over the past four years, and now we, are, we can see that 90% of our activity uh, it's already fully digitized and proactively detected. Uh, if we talk about proactively, uh, our proactive detection of any faults, we talk about accuracy, right? because we are talking about the logics behind it, and algorithm has been made uh, uh, based on the experience. Uh, so the, uh, currently, we are reaching around 96%. 96% of proactive detection of the fault uh, is, uh, is accurate, 100%. And eventually, that, uh, uh, let's say, the next step measurement has been taken to resolve the issue before it gets, uh, let's say, customer uh, facing an issue uh, at home or at uh, the premises. Uh, a new home service operating model. Uh, this is uh, the journey of the transformation of to be fully digitized. We have to change the complete organization to adapt with the, with the, with the uh, digital transformation. And this is we work on at Salat, how we can transform the, the, uh, the complete organization to, be, to align with the digitization. And the, the digitization will include the workflow, will include, uh, uh, it will touch the workflow, it will touch also the, the different, let's say, uh, departments within the, uh, the organization, how we can be more agile, how to be more fast. When we talk about uh, hours, it has been converted to a minutes of actions. This is a, uh, very important to be more agile that just now my colleague in Hawaii said how to be more agile. But this is a very important, I think, uh, step to be taken by all operators to start. If you didn't start uh, transforming to be fully digitized, uh, to be too late, too late, and uh, to be too tough to meet the customer experience uh, uh, targets. Plug and play also. This is also we started uh, a few years back how we can offer a plug and play service to the customer that they can take a device, plug it at home, and it will be a fully uh, provisioned and act activated without any, uh, let's say, field uh, visit to the, to the customer. Uh, predictive assurance, uh, this, is, this also the predicted it's part of the uh, digitization transformation that we have to predict and assure that all the services provided. I'm um, talking about here of the connectivity quality of service. Uh, they talk about the packet loss, how we can detect the packet loss, how we can detect the jitter uh, within the, uh, let's say, the connectivity that I'm providing to the customer. We use not to have this. We used to have only, if I lost the connect connectivity, I will be reporting a fault. Now it is not the case. We have to detect if even if a single packet loss uh, to that customer, I have to know about it. I have to act fast in order to fix the issue immediately. And uh, majority main complaints home related. Uh, this all the complaints we are talking about, which relate to the uh, at the two percent I just talked about, and how to uh, enhance the connectivity by the national broadband uh, program that we are running for since the pandemic starts. Um, we are working with Huawei on the FTTR fiber to the room. I think I visited the showcase, and I think it's very, um, very interesting for all of us. I think we have to take a small video now. Uh, it will be run. Uh, Mr. Abdurrahman is heading of the uh, fixed access network from Tassarat. Will present a, a new experience. I think this is, will be the new, the next step for us to to be taken in UAE uh, to provide. It will be, in addition to that, will generate a revenue stream to, to the operator. At the end, at the same time, will enhance the customer experience in the, in the coming period of time and, and will provide the best uh, class of services to the customers, targeting or covering all, uh, let's say, services provided uh, from uh, distance learning, uh, work from home, uh, online gaming, and other services, including the smart home uh, services. Uh, Let's uh, start the video. It will be taken only two minutes.
Good morning. My name is Abdurrahman Hamidan. I'm from Etisarat Fixed Access Network. The villa I'm in covers an area of 500 square meter, and there are 10 rooms in total. In collaboration with Huawei, the whole villa has been covered with gigabit services based on the latest FTTR solution. We have made some innovation attempts on the engineering and business aspects of this model villa site. With full house fiber deployment, we have got gigabit rates in every room. To be able to achieve this, we have used a combination of two models. The first is the hidden pipe deployment. We have deployed the current house pipelines and embedded the optical fiber into the living room, game room, and conference room, etc. The second is open line deployment. In the part without embedded hidden tubes, we used innovative transparent optical fiber scheme deployment. It doesn't destroy the original decoration and doesn't affect the appearance. As you have seen in the video just now, I believe that you have a detailed understanding of the project deployment scheme of FTTR. Probably now, you want to know what FTTR solution can bring to Etisarat in terms of business innovations. We believe that achieving whole house coverage using FTTR solution will help us achieve two main business breakthroughs. The first breakthrough is to improve the quality of the network. During the time of the pandemic, millions of people in the UAE need distance education and telecommuting, among which many users have poor Wi-Fi coverage and many users connect to 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi only, which impacts the speed and latency of the home experience. As you can see, FTTR can solve the problem of video quality and lag in the office environment. We believe that by addressing basic business connectivity and experience needs, we can significantly reduce the complaint rates from customers. The second breakthrough is to develop new business models. As we know, VR has a high demand of bandwidth and latency requirements. In the FTTR scenario, users can smoothly use VR boating, running, and other services. Online gaming also has high requirement for latency. Through FTTR solution, the delay can be stabilized below 100 milliseconds so that user can enjoy the feeling of ultimate experience. Similarly, ARPU values can be improved by developing more innovative business models. That's all from my side today. You are most welcome to visit the site. Uh, I think I, I think it's, this is, it will be an amazing that, and I'm sure uh, we'll be focusing on next time, uh, let's say, uh, the next period that time that on building with our partners, the, let's say, the fiber to the room. Um, I agree that during the pandemic, we, we have a tough time. But I think with the fiber to the home, uh, we'll be able to, pro to serve our customer and to provide all such services without any interruption. And when we start to talk about 98% of the fiber to the home uh, penetration, and again, I'm repeating, it's not a connectivity, it's a quality and experience. And by the fiber to the room, I think we can deliver the experience. I think this slide now will talk about that um, the journey, the cognitive, uh, we call it a software factory, which created the cognitive pro, uh, pro, uh, programs that covering the operational, from uh, operational aspects, and planning aspects, and the customer experience aspects. For three domains that we are working on, uh, within its Salat for the last now five years, in order to be fully digitized. And I'm proud uh, to say that we are uh, Ninety percent of our uh, network digitization has been uh, completed and delivered, and uh, I think Expo Expo 2020 is uh, is uh, one of the examples. I will end up by this slide. I think if uh, my colleagues, if you can go through the slide, without investing in future network intelligence, 
it's a race to the bottom. So to be fully digitized, to be fully automated, to enhance our customer experience, this will be our target, to be more efficient and more agile. All this, let's say, be, uh, will be uh, drives our sustainability. What is the network be flipped to a zero touch? If you imagine that, um, I will give you an example that we used to install uh, a mobile site. Traditionally, that takes um, two days of operation in order to install, integrate, commissioning the sites. We're talking about now uh, around 15 minutes. 15 minutes, we can install, integrate a mobile site, which is a zero touch that we can without any uh, remote intervention that the sites can be integrated after they install the site with immediately. Uh, so this is, a, this is one of the contribution to be more, more agile. We'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, all of you who are attending uh, uh, this uh, wonderful event. And we invite you, my pleasure to invite you to Expo 2020 and also to JITEX to visit its Salat booth at Jitex. Thank you very thank you very much. Big thank you to Mr. Zaid Al Saruni from Edislat for another brilliant presentation. Huawei believe that in the journey of digitalization, Edislat will continue to bring us new ideas, new methods, and new usage models in order to accelerate innovation in the experience economy. The global digital economy is constantly developing, as we know. Digital health and online education is making differences for every child all around the world, and Africa is no exception. Today, MTN Group is providing a diverse range of voice, data, digital, fintech, wholesale and enterprise services to more than 277 million customers across 21 markets. With the advent of the cloud era, networks as we know play a critical role in ensuring connectivity. However, how can we improve efficiency and drive the digital economy? To find out, let's invite on stage Mr. Ricardo Varzialis, CFO of MTM Global Connect, to share MTN's strategic thinking. Please invite on stage Mr. Ricardo Varzialis. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in front of a live audience which I think is testament to the great response that this country had on COVID that enables us to be here today and to also experience the recently opened uh, Expo 2020. So as per the introduction, I work at MTN Global Connect, which is the wholesale unit uh, of the MTN Group. And I would like to thank Huawei for putting together this conference and Albert from Huawei for, for taking care of all the logistics. And I'm going to be talking about how we are accelerating innovation to drive the digital solutions for Africa's progress. So Global Connect is the wholesale unit of the group. We have two large business areas. One is the mobility, where we have the international calls, A2P messaging, roaming hub. And then on the other side, we have what we call the fixed business, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today, that covers subsea cables, data centers, and terrestrial fiber. So to start the presentation, I'm going to start to talk about the PIN code of the world. So the world has a PIN code, and it's currently 1114. And that means that we have approximately 1 billion people in Europe, 1 billion people in the Americas, 1 billion people in Africa, and 4 billion people in Asia. Now, this PIN code is set to change, and by 2050, in the next 30 years, the PIN code of the world is going to become 1125. This means that Africa's population is set to double. Now, this is a huge, huge continent, and where the population is not only going to double, but it's also the youngest population in the world. And this young population is now coming online for the first time 
in a mobile experience. So their first internet experience is being done through mobile. So at MTN, we see this as a huge demographic opportunity to ensure that we bring the continent online and that we bring as many people as we can onto our networks. So MTN Group is currently the leading telecom operator in Africa. We have around 600 million people under our network coverage. Of these 600 million people, 277 are our clients. And of these clients, we have around 117 million uh, active data users and also approximately 49 million mobile money users. Now, these are mainly people that were previously unbanked that are now using MTN as their banking service provider. We're also the most valuable African bur brand. And uh, at the core of our belief is that everyone deserves the benefits of a modern connected life. So I'm going to play a short video that shows the profound impact that our products and platforms are having in the lives of our communities, our subscribers, and our stakeholders. How far can you go when your village is connected to the global village? You go. When 30 million people have a bank in their pocket, they go. Okay, so it's quite amazing to see how much we've uh, accomplished so far, but now we obviously want to keep scaling these platform businesses. And we announced recently that we want to structurally separate our fintech business to run it as an independent uh, uh, business, and we also want to structurally separate our Infraco business, so our fiber data center subsea assets, and run it as an open access uh, type of network uh, so we can scale the infrastructure on the continent. And what we're trying to do at MTN Global Connect, this is the problem statement that we are trying to solve. So we see a lot of uh, growth opportunity and uh, the chart here to my left is the studies that show that data demand in Africa is gonna triple over the next few years. Now, while this is happening, Africa still has a very low uh, fixed broadband penetration and installed data center capacity. So what you see in the middle of this uh, busy slide is the continent is really the, has the lowest fixed broadband uh, penetration in the world, and it's lagging even other developing regions. So fiber is a scale business and uh, you know often there's only room for a few players so for us it's very important that this is done as open access networks if we really want to change the connectivity in the continent at the same time the data center capacity is far from where it should be and it has another issue which is it's highly concentrated in one country which is south africa now, there are several projects being announced for large-scale uh, data centers in the continent, and we will see a lot of things happening uh, uh, on this front. But we at MTN see ourselves as being uniquely positioned to lead uh, this change of connectivity in the continent, given that we have already built the largest pan-African fiber network in Africa. So how are we going to tackle this problem? So first, I'll talk now about uh, subsea cables. And Global Connect, we are one of the main investors and providers of subsea cables on the continent. We are an investor on, from AIG to WAX to ACE. 
Uh, and we now recently announced our partnership with Facebook and uh, a few other operators to um, go live with Chew Africa. Now, Chew Africa is a transformative subsea cable. Uh, it is the largest subsea cable ever built in the world. This is a, a $1.5 billion project. It's going to land in over 30 countries, so around 34 countries. It recently announced an expansion into the Arabian Gulf that will also allow it to connect into the Middle East and India. By the time it's live, it will serve over 3 billion people. Now, we couldn't be more proud than to be part of this consortium uh, as we see it as being highly transformative for the continent. And just to give an idea, this cable alone is going to double the existing subsea cable capacity on the continent. So it's more than double of all the other subsea cables that are there today combined. And we see this as a key fundamental change to improve connectivity in, in, in the continent. At, at MTN Global Connect is going to be the landing party in a lot of the sub-Saharan countries, so namely Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and Sudan. And the cable will go live in 2023 and 2024. Then on the terrestrial side, uh, we have here, so if we see there on the map in yellow, we have our existing fiber networks. So this is fiber that's already on the ground. And we now want to connect the continent going from east to west in an open access service model. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab the existing fiber networks, we're going to put them in uh, independent fiber codes, and then we're going to patch all this network together so that we can cross the continent and provide low latency connectivity to landlocked countries. So this is still a, a fundamental part of the puzzle. There are a lot of landlocked countries in the continent that don't have access to the subsea cables. This would bring much needed connectivity to a lot of these countries um, at the right latency and at affordable costs. It's also going to provide alternative routes into Europe and Asia for the entire continent. Now, we are looking, we are already in discussions and we're looking to partner with the governments, with development financing institutions, to ensure we have the right partnership models, whether they're public-private partnerships, and as much as we can, use already existing fiber. So there's a lot of dark fiber in Africa that's not fully utilized, and whether it was the power companies or the railroad companies or even pipelines that build it, we want to, as much as possible, make use to it and bring it uh, into a seamless network. Now, while we're trying to do this, uh, and it was a topic that we heard before, on our subsea, uh, what we call our .NET uh, MPLS network, we're already operating as a zero-touch network. We want to make sure that once we build and connect all of these different fiber networks, that we also operate a zero-touch network, where we can move the activation of links from weeks to hours. And this is very, very key to what we're trying to do. Another key component where we see a, a, a big opportunity is in connecting the data centers to fiber. So right now in, in sub-Saharan Africa, you have four main digital hubs. Those are Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana. There's up and coming new digital hubs, and we see a lot of value in making sure that we connect data centers to our fiber networks. Now, when we talk about data centers, the hyperscalers, they typically want one terabyte connections to their facilities. Um, and we expect to start reaching these volumes as soon as 2025 in Africa. But currently, the networks we are, were designed for the 100 to 200 gigabit type of, 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 of fiber networks. So as we are rolling out this new fiber, we need to make sure that we future-proof it and we're looking at building pipes that go 10 terabytes and can go even higher, up to 100 if needed. And this is a key fundamental part of the equation because we want to make sure that these hyperscalers can locate their data in Africa. There's more and more 
a, a public agenda of keeping African data inside the continent, and we want to enable this from an infrastructure perspective. So, we also finally, to bring it all together, we see a lot of value co-creation by combining these different type of assets. So combining the subsea cables with the terrestrial fiber and with the data centers uh, under different partnership models. And what this enables us is on the one side, it's going to enable us to maximize the traffic on our fiber networks. By, by, by bringing in the connectivity to the data centers and to our metro rings, is also going to address our own internal requirements, whether it's for mobile data or our emerging digital uh, platforms like fintech and music streaming, video streaming. Um, it's going to maximize the value of our existing facilities. So at MTN, we already have several data center facilities spread across the network we can use this to also bring in partners and make sure we, we, we maximize the usage on those data centers. It's going to help us improve the quality of service and latency, and this is becoming very, very, very important as we start rolling out 5G on the continent, and as edge computing becomes a hot topic, we need to make sure our networks are ready to deliver on the customer experience that 5G promises. And finally, we want to provide wholesale content distribution. So already in the continent, we have video as generating over 75% of the total data traffic. This is expected to continue to grow. And coupled with that, data demand is going to grow threefold in the continent in the next three years. So we need scalable networks. Now, the last slide, since I'm uh, in finance, we need to put always a, a slide with numbers. So where we are today, we provide, as I said, the submarine access on a lot of cables. We own 85,000 kilometers of proprietary fiber on the continent, and this is mainly the long-distance fiber and metro rings. And we've been starting to connect these different networks together with cross-border links. Now, we see a $1 billion market opportunity for the terrestrial fiber on the continent, with the market growing threefold by 2025. So our ambition by 2025, so the next uh, three to four years, is to grow our fiber network to 135,000 kilometers of proprietary fiber, connecting all the different countries. This will enable us to generate in excess of $300 million in revenue per year on this fiber, and it will also entrench us as the number one African subsea and terrestrial uh, fiber player. So before I go, I just leave you with um, an adaptation of the African proverb we saw in the video, which says that if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you need to grow together. Thank you very much. A big thank you once again to Ricardo Varzias for another really in-depth and insightful presentation. Huawei believe that more business innovations will only serve to promote the development of the digital economy. In recent years, the Nordic countries have become home to some of the world's largest tech companies. To meet the demands of these giants, Global Connect was created through the merger of several companies to form Northern Europe's leading digital infrastructure provider in 2020. Today, we are absolutely honored to invite Per Martin Torvaldsen, the chairman of the GC board, to share Global Connect's development strategy. Please welcome Per Martin Torvaldsen to the stage. So, thank you very much for being invited. It's a pleasure being here. And I must also personally say it's fabulous to actually see live people again. Now, living in Zoom and Teams for 18 months becomes quite depressive. And I would also like to say initially that <laughs> 
the arranger or the program for this keynote speaker must have been a, had a good progress. Now we are going from the global connect on the southern part of the world to a global connect as far north you can come uh, from the, uh, in the world. Uh, what we are, I'm going to do is to make a short, some short views and uh, presentation on some learnings we have made through this pandemic and how that actually can grow some business going forward. To give you just a short context, uh, Global Connect is uh, owned by the private capital company EQT, one of the biggest ones in the world, and the InfraFunds. And it started out with buying out large fiber companies and data centers in Denmark and northern Germany. Then we did several acquisitions in Norway and then in Sweden. And now we have merged all together and creating this kind of Scandinavian, Northern European fiber champion. We are not into mobile. This is a pure fixed operation. And we are mostly uh, focusing on B2B enterprise customers. Enterprise customer for us would be anything from mission critical. We had built dedicated fiber networks for all healthcare institutions. In Norway, we also are serving the blue light networks, all sizes of uh, private enterprises. And we are also building fiber to the homes, approximately 380,000 at this point in time, but all delivered to service providers and content providers. We do not offer you know, any significant uh, volume of end user services ourselves. The footprint has become quite big. We are at 84,500 kilometers at this point in time, and we do have approximately 27,000 square meters of data centers, and those are mainly in Denmark, where we are the far biggest provider of data center. Some of the learnings we have made in these Scandinavian countries, and also that we think should be a significant potential for growth going forward, is very much related to that the home offices actually became the formal offices of the businesses. It was a lot related to cybersecurity and also how the CIO were actually capable of managing this situation when it occurred and how that actually can be developed going forward. These are some average numbers. In average, in Scandinavia, approximately 35% of the people were sent home and were not allowed to be in the offices. In the peaks, and especially like March 2020 in Norway, 75%, meaning basically everyone was sent home and were then forced to work from home. It was only healthcare critical functions that were allowed to meet physically in the offices. We also did some service around the countries on how that was re or received by the employees and what, how that actually worked out. As uh, you can see in the bars in the middle, we interviewed 4,000 Swedish people and asked what is really important for you working from home. And as you can see, fast broadband was then among the highest one. And I'm not sure what's wrong about Swedes, but as you can see, dishwashers were then equivalent to the level of fast broadband. So dishwashers was ranked high in Sweden. We also interviewed 500 CEOs and CIOs on what kind of challenges and problems they were facing on the IT and network side. And as you can see from the numbers, it's a variety of problems that occurred, everything from slow systems, system failures, poor network performance, cyber attacks, and also the lack of capacity storage became a problem for a lot of enterprises. And this is the one of the topics I think we as an industry has, let's say, overseen too long, and we didn't really pay enough attention to this part of the network and digital industry. When everyone was sent home and there was a new setting, the cyber criminals also found huge new business opportunities, and they have also used them quite well, unfortunately. And we have been facing a lot of major situation, especially on the ransomware side. Large enterprises, lockdown system, uh, encrypted data not available, 
big blackmail amounts to be paid. That's also a part of the, this picture. And as the number shows, the increase from the pre-pandemic area was huge. And if you put all of these three dimensions together, what at least we learned from the major of the CIOs we talked to, this situation more or less created a perfect storm. This example on the left side here is a practical example for one customer. They had 50 business locations, and suddenly overnight, with one day's notice from the authorities, they had to send everyone home, and that means they went from 50 locations to approximately 2,000 home offices that were expected to be operational the day after. That created a massive problem for, for the CIOs. First of all, they didn't have any management tools to really oversee and control then what was happening, going from these 40 control locations to suddenly 2,000 locations to enter the networks and the platforms. They experienced a lot on the network side, on, especially on the access, poor DSL connections, you had excavators cutting fibers, uh, you had employees then losing access at all, and the security was compromised big time for a lot of these customers. And if you put this together, we think this is also, again, addressing the enterprise market, public institutions, if you put this picture together, it also creates a huge new business opportunity to build solutions that is actually designed differently from pre-COVID. The national authorities in Norway expect, as the number here say, 39% of the workforce, that means 39% more than before COVID, will have a more permanent home office solution and working more from home. Uh, we already see a lot of enterprises selling down assets, selling buildings, reducing space of offices, indicating that they are planning for a new setup for their workforce. There is also a need then for a completely different resilience in the network and especially on the access side. And also on the security levels, we need to find new and different solutions. And as you see in the middle there, we also interviewed quite a lot of customers and we see a very big shift in the way they would like to procure and buy solutions going forward. A lot of these customers were traditionally this one-stop shopping they had left and they were go, had gone into this strategy of shopping around. They had one provider for VPN, they would have another provider for the launch solutions in the buildings and the Wi-Fi. They had a third provider on the, on the firewalls and the security platforms. They had a fourth provider on the cloud connectivity. And suddenly, when all this fell apart, they were just uh, running around and asked all the providers to try to fix things, but actually no one was responsible. And that we also see on the trend, on the answers we got, that these customers would also like to buy more online and less physical meetings in the sales process. And we asked then Bain and McKinsey to do some research on kind of that trend and how that is evolving. And as you can see on the x-axis here, that's the kind of contract value of an enterprise contract. And the y-axis would then be the sales process. And the light blue indicates that the customer have the preference to do it digital. And you can see the bar for actually going full digital from prospect, selecting vendor, signing contract, is now to a quite high level value-wise that they would like a full digital process. In our view, that also creates a challenge, at least the telecom industry in Scandinavia, historically extremely manual, physical meetings, presentations to customers. That's also a new setup. We need to change to actually be competitive and also meet the preferences of the customers. And the way we have put all these data and findings together is basically to build a new concept. And uh, as everyone we respect for themselves in the telecom, 
we put some new abbreviations on it. So we have put together what we call managed end-to-end -end connectivity, then named METEC. And that was, again, the METEC is built on these three pillars. It's really building a new uh, resilient level on the access, meaning even to the homes that will be a part of home offices, it consists of fiber access and the failover with fixed wireless access based on 4G or 5G. And that has basically to be a part of the access network strategy alongside with the formal offices in place. We have put a lot of attention to figure out how to address these security questions and put that into the solutions. And also the fact that we need to look at the LAN, the local area network, the Wi-Fi, as a part, integrated part of the wide area network. The customers really does not want any longer a distinct borderline between those two levels in the network. And this is basically a summary of what we are now building and proposing to the customers. The failover, double access failover on the top left to meet the resilience requirements. Then building the LAN and MAN together based on SASE architecture, secure access service edge, but also bringing the LAN part, meaning the management of the LAN systems into the same solution. So it's a kind of an end-to-end, -end, including the Wi-Fi and the controllers on site and the equipment at home as a part of the solution. And then the security part, next generation firewalls, zero trust based architectures, and the really Difficult part there is how you really separate this identity management and the privileged access management. A lot of the problems the customers faced was how to cope with the privileged accesses when you are sending people home and they will not be exploited to any cyber attacks or an intruder traffic. So that is basically next generation to be integrated in to the SASE platforms. And what we are developing ourselves, because we couldn't really find any vendors doing that, on top, that is basically the portals for the CIOs. How do you make a dashboard that can track, control, overview, all that kind of stuff in an aggregated way, but still taking the security part, the access part, and the wide area part into the same dashboard? That's then a development we are making on top of the other three. So that is the kind of far north visions of how we could make some more profitability on the enterprise size from the learnings we did from COVID-19. And as I said, we are then calling it METEC, Managed End-to-End -end Connectivity. Thank you very much for your attention. A big thank you there to Mr. Thorvaldsen for another excellent presentation, which once again went into in-depth insights on GC strategy, which is to develop B2B services, and the execution path is very clear. And Huawei believes that in collaboration with GC, they can continue to drive innovation. Digital transformation is the main theme in the education sector. Innovative ICT technologies are accelerating schools' digital transformation and, as a result, are improving classroom teaching quality. Next up is Dr. Wakir Mahmood. He is the CTO of Higher Education Commission in Pakistan, and he will give a keynote speech on accelerating digital transformation and creating new value in education. Please welcome Dr. Wakir Mahmood to the stage. researchers, business leaders, uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, and uh, thanks to the uh, conference organizers for giving the opportunity to speak about the digital transformation of uh, higher education sector in, in Pakistan and the kind of values it has uh, generated over time. 
uh, in the way it is going. The Higher Education Commission in Pakistan was established in about 2002 time frame as an autonomous body. And uh, this, uh, since being autonomous, uh, it has been able to create that value which was required. Uh, the, the main objective of the Higher Education Commission has been to, uh, to evaluate, uh, improve, and promote the higher education research and development activities. And it has been able to conduct uh, these ac activities through the improvement in access. So there has been a large number of uh, enrollment increase, uh, manifold, over the past few years. Uh, there have been many scholarships uh, for international research and uh, PhD training given to the faculty. There have been more teachers that have been involved. Large number of scholarships programs have been uh, uh, introduced. And many more universities have been uh, established for the past 15, 20 years and ODL, distance learning programs, got started. So this improved the access uh, to higher education in Pakistan. And then comes the, the quality part, which is the responsibility of higher education. Uh, in this quality domain, uh, there have been international standards which have been followed. Uh, Pakistan is a full signatory of the Washington Accord, uh, which is for the engineering education uh, under the Pakistan Engineering Council. And it is also following the, uh, the Bologna uh, the uh, processes which uh, provide the, uh, uh, the, uh, the interoperability, uh, the student uh, mobility between uh, different nations. So, uh, and then uh, good research funding got made available, uh, capacity of the teachers got improved. Uh, and then uh, since the PhDs from advanced countries uh, were returning to Pakistan, so the quality had automatically got improved. Then uh, in the research and development uh, domain, relevance uh, is, is very important, which uh, higher education is uh, keeping track of uh, in terms of providing targeted research funding for the socioeconomic improvement and development uh, of the nation. So uh, what the HEC is trying, it is trying to make universities as the engine of growth and also provide opportunity of knowledge-based economy development within the country. Uh, so it also uh, supports the academia industry linkage uh, activity uh, through a technology development fund, which is specific for uh, this, uh, this kind of promotion. Uh, and then it has uh, established various business incubation centers within universities and also have Office of Research, Innovation and, and, and uh, Commercialization established in various universities. Uh, and then there is a uh, major focus uh, from higher education uh, in the field of uh, innovation, specifically in the fourth industrial revolution domain. So it has established uh, specialized centers uh, in the area of IoT, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, cloud analytics, uh, cybersecurity, robotics. Uh, these are the centers which are, uh, which are consisting of uh, labs uh, as consortium within various universities. And there's one, uh, one of them is a, is a core lab, and then there are satellite labs in various universities. So universities work under collaboration in conducting this research. Uh, now, achieving the uh, Higher Education Commission objectives with the help of uh, strategies that it is, uh, it is uh, following, uh, since it is an autonomous body, so with autonomy comes the responsibility. So it has been able to uh, do certain reforms uh, in the sense that it is now uh, develop universities at a faster track. So the processes have been simplified, new programs can be added more quickly. Uh, and then uh, the, from, the, is, uh, from the quality perspective, the insurance of uh, quality in terms of every level of uh, teaching and learning practices is insured. Uh, this is, again, the responsibility from Higher Education Commission perspective. The curriculum, there are several committees which are built, which, in, uh, which uh, enhances the curriculum and make it uh, up, to, uh, up to date uh, with the latest development as a requirement, and it is done very often. And then the main strategy is regarding the IT infrastructure and IT platform provisioning within the higher education sector in, in Pakistan. So it has a focus on paperless environment uh, where various kind of ERPs and automation got introduced. And more importantly, the universities within Pakistan, they are connected through a network which is called PERN network, Pakistan Engineering Resource Network. Uh, and then uh, cloud uh, is becoming available uh, to various universities at the central level. And, uh, and further applications are being developed. Uh, smart classrooms are being deployed in various universities in Pakistan. And then uh, data centers are becoming available to give the uh, cloud services. And then 
the safe and smart campus opportunity are, are being rolled out. So I'll, I'll give you more detail about those. Uh, and then uh, the another strategy, as I mentioned earlier, is the global engagement, where a uh, lot of uh, faculty members from universities in Pakistan, they were given scholarships, tens and thousands of those, in the past 20 years, uh, to go out for a PhD training in uh, advanced countries uh, that include US, Europe, uh, Canada, China, Japan, and, and so on. And then there are many foreign students which are uh, invited in Pakistan for, for their studies. And many uh, students from Pakistan were, uh, under a joint program were sent abroad uh, for their research. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Pakistan is a full uh, signatory of Washington Accord for the, uh, for the engineering education, and also it follows the Bologna process. And the capacity building is done with the help of uh, National Academy of Higher Education. Uh, and then, uh, within that academy, the uh, training is conducted for uh, faculty members which is the, before, they are, before they are hired or before they are given the opportunity to go in class, so they are given the training of pedagogy. And then within the service training is also provided, and there are several workshops are organized, not only for uh, the uh, faculty, but also for the administrative uh, staff of universities. Uh, and then various reforms have been uh, taken up, uh, which, uh, which have improved the overall uh, enrollment quality uh, of higher education sector in the country. Uh, the, uh, for example, tenure track system got, uh, got implemented in Pakistan, uh, with the help of which the, the salaries of a faculty member almost become equivalent to a salary of a minister, so that it tracks the best uh, talent in the country for, for uh, teaching uh, opportunities. Uh, and then uh, a, a system got developed so that the governance uh, can be improved in, uh, in universities for higher uh, uh, opportunities and, uh, uh, and quality of uh, education. Uh, going forward, looking at the, uh, the improvements and requirements that are coming up uh, in, in order to have the universities operate the way they are required to, uh, there are a large number of ICT uh, interventions that are required. Uh, and in, in looking at this uh, from the learning and teaching and learning perspective, uh, the questions are then how to innovate teaching practices uh, in, in, including the, uh, the distance learning, uh, blended learning opportunities, and how to accelerate the teaching resource sharing, uh, which is very, one, one very important aspect, and how to enable the full development of uh, professionals when they come out, they are industry ready. Uh, then in the space of uh, service delivery, then how to converge data for unified management, and how to build a smart and safe campus, how to build a campus which is uh, green, and energy optimized. Uh, and then on, on the other hand, uh, on the application side, uh, how to build a unified ICT system to support uh, education applications and how to build full connectivity and discourage development in silos. Different universities, they try to bring their own uh, set of uh, ICT interventions, uh, applications, uh, which are sometimes they become hard to integrate. So we need to have a unified approach and then how to improve the efficiency and reduce the operational expense. Uh, the uh, activities that have been going on in uh, the higher education sector in the country, uh, we have smart university program which got rolled out. Uh, and uh, with, within that program, we have uh, smart campuses, about 130 plus campuses in Pakistan, universities have been converted into smart campuses, having a Wi-Fi network available throughout their facilities. And uh, with the help of surveillance cameras, about 105 universities have been converted into safe universities. Uh, and a large number of uh, students have been provided smart bags. That includes the uh, laptop and other computing devices to them. Uh, and then smart classrooms are being rolled out. Uh, and then we, we hope that about 1,000 plus uh, uh, smart classrooms will be established in the, in the country uh, in the various universities. And the evaluation system, of course, uh, and then uh, higher education uh, management information system in, from the perspective of online learning, uh, and then the evaluation system, the teaching management system, they are, they are being deployed in various universities. And then in promoting the research and innovation and development activities, uh, there are several research uh, funding programs have been established uh, by the Higher Education Commission, providing peer-reviewed uh, un under competition-based uh, research funding to the, uh, to the faculty members. And then uh, having a knowledge uh, center established, incubation center established with the help of uh, companies like Huawei, 
uh, Cisco, SAP, and, uh, and Oracle. Uh, introduction of Open Lab uh, for research and uh, collaboration activities where different universities can uh, have their uh, individuals either sent or through an online access uh, provide the opportunity. Then we have R&D facilities uh, set up with the help of Huawei. We have Huawei authorized network academies in about 60 universities of Pakistan. And then education TV and uh, other IT talent cultivation activities are happening in the country. Uh, going forward, uh, you will see that the, 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 at, the, at the core level, we have an education backbone network with the help of PERN, which, gets, which got established, and it's, it's available. And then from the education cloud unified structure perspective, we need to have that convergence architecture that we have seen some of the presentations today. So we are following that path where we can have this con uh, converged architecture with the help of uh, the, the cloud services together with the network services. So the kind of things that we are de deploying in universities the, from the smart campus perspective, the, uh, the safe campus perspective, and then uh, the uh, the uh, video conferencing, and then the smart classroom opportunities, digital library, uh, and then LMS and CMS. So these are so many applications which are required and which are getting uh, now deployed in various universities. So they need to be uh, available on, on a convergence platform so that all of them can work together. Uh, so with this uh, cloud network uh, convergence, we have synergy with, with the help of smart campus, with the kind of technologies that are getting deployed. Uh, so once we have a uh, low latency network with less than 20 millisecond uh, latency, we can provide uh, zero buffering for the uh, smart classroom application where the lectures in one classroom, in the primary classroom, are relayed in the secondary classroom uh, without having any, uh, it's seamless without a delay. So it's kind of re real time experience. And then the PER network, as I mentioned earlier, is providing connectivity all across. Uh, a smart campus opportunity is providing the wireless connectivity to students and faculty and staff everywhere. And then, of course, online learning is providing the access. So uh, from the private and public cloud perspective, so we, we have the opportunity where we provide these services in a unified and convergent platform. Uh, and then it, it gives the opportunity for researchers to continue uh, with their research more efficiently. Uh, for the teaching, learning uh, opportunities to happen more efficiently in classes, in, in remote areas, and otherwise. Uh, so what we have is a flexible cloud opportunity. So one connection to multiple clouds, this allows uh, the individuals to, uh, to, to have the services available. Uh, smart classrooms are getting promoted uh, in, in Pakistan, as I mentioned earlier. In phase one, 50 universities uh, have been uh, provided with the smart classroom. Uh, with, uh, of course, uh, they have uh, uh, a primary uh, classroom, and then there is a secondary classroom. There are about 100 classrooms uh, already being established. Each classroom has a, a smart a digital board. Uh, camera, of course, that, uh, that is one requirement. And then other accessories that are available there. And about 30 VDIs are provided to students. So that gives a real-time experience to the uh, secondary classroom that is attached. I, and, the, and, the, uh, and the data which flows, uh, the streaming opportunity is through a pipe which is available from PERN, uh, which is at 40 gigabit per uh, 40, uh, 40 G at this time, and we are in the process of increasing it to 100 G. Uh, and then the high accessibility with the help of a large number of cores, about five cores are available in the network now, and we are, we are hoping to improve these IP cores so that we continue to provide more uh, uh, the uh, accessibility at a higher level. The cloud itself is uh, uh, in, a, in a unified platform is making the, the services available. Uh, and then in phase two and three, we, we plan to increase not only the number of uh, universities which will have the uh, opportunity of uh, smart classroom, uh, but also colleges will also become part of this whole overall program. Uh, and then we will have a higher number of uh, uh, the accessibility uh, points where we can have uh, redundancy available in the network so that uh, we have uh, no failure during live uh, in transmission of classes. Uh, the uh, One Campus uh, Network enable interactive teaching and, uh, and improving uh, the teaching quality perspective. You will, you will notice that the applications that are required to be run on uh, the uh, unified platform. Uh, we, we have just uh, reviewed a few of the uh, presentations about the technology itself. Uh, and here we have opportunity where we can do the planning, uh, the setting up of the, uh, of the overall network, and then maintenance and the optimization in a more optimized and uh, improved manner. 
uh, so that a large number of services become available uh, in this unified framework. And then what we have is a uh, improved uh, learning efficiency since we have availability of, uh, of network to in individuals at the wireless level. So about 30% improvement in learning efficiency. And then we have about 75% uh, cost of learning uh, reduced. Reason being, we have now access to the ADO ROM. Uh, capacity available for students to avail uh, the, uh, uh, the services from a university at any, at any place, anywhere uh, they can uh, join. And then troubleshooting is, is more automated. So it's about 50% uh, more efficiency in troubleshooting. The Pakistan Education Research Network, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, connecting at this time 350 universities and colleges in, within 65 cities uh, of the country. Uh, we have one national data center which is available in Islamabad, and the next two are planned in Karachi and uh, Lahore. Uh, 250 plus sites uh, on video conferences are available, and we plan to have about 3,000 plus uh, universities and colleges uh, connected on this per network in the coming years. Uh, so the, the integration of innovative technology is, is the critical aspect of uh, providing the, uh, the provisioning at a, uh, at a more efficient level. Uh, and then improve the experience. Uh, in the technologies that we heard today, uh, we plan to implement a majority of them, for example, the network slicing. That will allow the exclusive bandwidth available uh, for a specific application, uh, and it is not shared. So in this way, we can have, say, for example, video conferencing or the VDA application or the, uh, or the Safe Campus camera streaming uh, that has its own, uh, its own pipe available. And similarly, uh, coming forward with the SRV6 uh, protocol, we will have the configuration made more uh, easy and, uh, and convenient. So these applications are being built. So once we have uh, the technology deployed the way I just explained, but we'll have the opportunity to uh, provide the equitable uh, the, uh, educational resources for the students all across the country. Uh, it will improve uh, uh, the, uh, the learning outcome for the students. Uh, of course, there is a robust environment that we have provided there. Uh, which creates an active learning community, uh, and then overall uh, impact on the economy of the, of the country once we have high quality and better suited graduates coming out of, univers uh, of universities, and then of course that increases the job growth and the overall country improvement. So this is all I wanted to mention today, and thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you to Dr. Wakir Mahmood for his insights on how technology is really transforming education. Huawei hopes that smart teaching will be ubiquitous in classrooms and will enable more people to access and enjoy a better quality of education. We're now entering into the second phase of our session. Uh, we have seen several presentations related to the digital transformation of enterprises and verticals. That was the first part of today's keynote. In the second part of our session, we're going to discuss digital transformation in the home and its impact on the nuclear family. Digital transformation is accelerating and greatly changing our lives as we've already highlighted and outlined so far today. And networks, as we know, are the foundation of that digitalization. STC Group is a world-class telecom operator with a leading network and service. At today's UBBF, we're absolutely honored and delighted to invite Mr. Badir Abdullah Alhib, Infrastructure Sector VP of STC Group, KSA Operations, to share their Network 2025 strategy and their best practices with us. Please invite onto the stage Mr. Badir Abdullah Alhib. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a pleasure to be here with you. Actually, uh, it's been quite a while to be in such gathering uh, during after the pandemic. Today, I'm going to talk about the uh, give, uh, STC uh, journey and uh, a future plan on the transport domain and what is the, the development in the infrastructure to support or accelerate the digitalization in Saudi Arabia. In the beginning, I will talk about the NSTC or in, in, the, in our country. Our senior leader <coughs> the, the built a, a great uh, vision in, in, in Saudi. It's called the 2030 K KSA vision to, to lay the foundation 
and the and the and the country for uh, the the, fu the, uh, the future. So since we are in transformation stage, and also in a transition, and this in this vision, the use uh, the digital is is our focus. NSTC. Uh, in the similar time, we were uh, we, we were also uh, adapting the, the, the vision with our COVID strategy there, in order to be the the main enabler for the digital transformation in the in the country, as a, a technology sector, and an STC, we we develop our technology st strategy called Rakami which is to develop our structure and to build a strong infrastructure to support or to accelerate the digitization in the country. And the Rakami strategy is consists of multiple domain, and it's, not, uh, it's for the 5G digitization and transformation of, the, uh, of, of, our, of, our, of our company, and also the focusing on the cybersecurity and data analytics. And today, we're going to focus on the uh, and, and, and transmission and transmission domain or the transport domain. Uh, starting that to improve our uh, ex customer experience at home, and also to improve to support the, uh, our business and digitization, and, and we're going to talk about what we are doing in, in our network to increase the fiberization uh, coverage in, in our network to reach everybody or to reach all the, our customer either from consumer or enterprise, and how we are building and modernizing our network, and also how we are moving to the center centrics. For the home user, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia and also in the GCC, our citizens are living in, in villas, and villas is, is contained from two to four floors. And each floor, it's about the 200 to 400 square meter, and this is, will be a challenge for, for us to reach, or for the customer to, to reach, to give providing better experience in terms of the broadband service inside the house, and reach each room and each location and providing the higher speed. So in Saudi Arabia, we have more than 3.2 million houses for, for, more, for having more than four rooms, and also 45% of the customer are experienced uh, a Wi-Fi coverage issue, it's, uh, it's around the speed is below the, the 800 Mbps. And with the, with the change that's happening in the market, and also with, with during the pandemic, people are demanding for more data and more connectivity and, and, and better experience because they're using it for the entertainment, as watching the streaming, the videos, and the content is it's already changing from full HD, from HD to full HD to 4K, which is required a higher speed. The, uh, also, during the pandemic, people adapting working from home, which require the stable connectivity and higher speed with low latency, since they are using video during their meetings. And also, the gaming is one of the important subjects as well, which been since we have uh, a very young nation in Saudi, they, they uh, really uh, are more to, to the gaming and, and uh, require to have the better experience in the gaming and better latency, which is required for the online gaming. To, to, in order to overcome these uh, yes, issues and improving our connectivity, we start adapting the fiber to the room, which is con uh, expanding our fiber to the room and, connect and connecting our access point with one gig speed to improve the customer experience and also the, the, the latency. For the enterprise, since the, the government are moving very fast in the e-government e and digitizing majority of our uh, uh, process and, and in, in, in the country, the, also the inter we need to enable the network in order to be ready for uh, and building the, the strong foundation in, in our infrastructure in order to connect the fiber and digital connectivity everywhere, and also building a, a strong data center in order to host the government and also the enterprise segment in our data center in our cloud, or in our uh, partner cloud like Google Cloud and Microsoft Cloud to provide very low latency for multiple use cases and hosting their, their application and, and, the, and their network. So 
it's, it's, we are focusing in multiple industry. It's not only the banking sector, uh, the oil and gas, and also the uh, uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the, the secure cyber security. Even the, one of the things that we are focusing on in NSTC. Plus, we have also the. Uh, the government, which is the most important thing that we are doing since we are the main enabler in the, in the country for, for the government to, for digitization. So, in STC, having a largest network infrastructure in KSA, and it, we have a, a big fiber network around 229,000 kilometers being deployed in, in, across the kingdom. This is for the transport. And also, we have more than 12 data centers across the kingdom. The daily traffic for both, or daily volume traffic for fixed and mobile, it's around 50, 55 petabytes a day. Uh, this has required a very strong network, modernized, with higher capacity, with higher technology. And also, we have a connectivity with, with the international submarine cable with multiple landing stations in our country, reconnected with more than 100 countries. So even, uh, even with that strong network, still we have, we have uh, challenges. Yes, we have a cable network and, uh, and still available in our network. We have 36% of our customers still in the cable network. And also, the, the speed they are getting it's below 50 meg. It's depending on the technology that they are using and the distance that they, between them and, and the cabinet. So in, all, in order to resolve some of these, these problems, you know, what we are doing, we have multiple solutions. One of them is the, uh, what I'm showing here as an example, to use the existing infrastructure and the, using the deck system that we have. And we can build a small OLTs in the outdoor unit and connecting the last mile to the customer for the area that's not being covered. In 2018, there was a national broadband initiative from the government and the STC were the main operator getting that project and we deployed in two years around 1.2 million, uh, or we connect 1.2 million household with the fiber. Still, we didn't cover everything in the kingdom. You know, we have very large kingdom and very large city. It's, white, it's, a, it's a white country. We are continuing improving our connectivity by using uh, a really an innovative connectivity and solution to reach, to reach the customer and providing them with better service in order to improve the ex customer experience, to improve the time to market, and also uh, to, give them, to give them better services. F for the modernization of, of, the of the transport network, still we are doing a modernization for a couple of, for, for, for it's, it's, a, it's a journey and not something can be done in one year. We are modernizing our network since we have end of support equipment in, in our network, which is uh, having a security concern. We need to up, uh, update our network and modernize it. And also, whenever we move to the new technology, we will be able to consolidate and simplif simplify the network. We will reduce the space and the power in our data center and our exchanges. Also, we'll, we will be able to automate and be more efficient. And we have end-to-end -end automation the, for, for the operation. We're going to have also better efficiency in the, in the operation. So what in the past, we start doing the, the, transfer, the, the modernization to the network. And alhamdulillah, till today, we'll be able to manage to reduce the TCO by 20%. And we, we are faster to the market by 50%. And we reduce around 100 megawatt uh, uh, of our uh, consumption in, in our data center. And, and data center infrastructure. So in order to reach yani, or, or to improve our infrastructure in, in terms of data center and to be ready for the new technology and, and, and the cloud and the and fiber to mobile conversion and the slicing and all these things, today we have six data center, regional data center. It's not a normal data center. We have multiple data center in, in, in the cities. And we are building uh, more data center. We're going to reach to 14 data center by 2024. This is in order to, just move, to grow in our cloud hosting the hyperscaler in our network, which is, will be uh, a cooperation work with the hyperscaler, as I mentioned before, such like the Microsoft and, and, uh, and Google. So we can host uh, the, our customer with our cloud or either uh, the hyperscaler cloud and providing them with extra services with lower latency. 
we are also building the, our edge, edge data center. Edge data center in order to use it for multiple use cases, like the 5G use cases. We are doing some of, of, of the, we have some projects with, with the, some of the big companies in, in Saudi to install our edge computing in their premises in order to have their data and also uh, the, the it will be in their premise and we can provide ultra low latency for some of the use cases. It's really mandatory for some of the refinery or, or the factories. In the last, I, I want to say that this is a, a, a continuous journey. It will not end by doing all this or doing the, the, uh, the transform, the modification that we are doing or what we are doing in, in, the, in the network in order to simplify and to continue doing that to improve the customer experience and provide. We need to accelerate in the coming three years the uh, adapting of the FTTR uh, to, in, in, the, in the customer, yes, in our consumer. And also, we need, we need to still start focusing also on the super site uh, building that what we're doing in, in some of the, of, the, of the city, like Neom or like King Abdullah Financial City. We have uh, fiber connectivity with, with uh, high capacity of the DWM system connected with our, uh, our submarine cable and our network, and also having our cloud and hosting the, the, you know, the enterprise customer to provide, to provide them with very ultra low latency. So, and also to provide best efficiency, we need to, we need to, to, to continue expanding our fiber coverage to reach every, uh, our customer. And also, we, we need to continue modernizing uh, our, our SDH network and the DWM system for uh, better technology to have better capacity and higher capacity, and also um, modernizing uh, the network for the, for the new technology. This is, that this is all. Thank you very much, gentlemen. A big thank you there to Badir Abdullah al Hib for another excellent presentation, a brilliant, brilliant speech. Uh, Huawei believes that SDC's high-quality network will continue to accelerate the industry's digitalization and let more people access and enjoy a better digital life. Today, as we know, fiber connects millions of households and has changed our way of life. For example, in the industry of personal entertainment and how we consume and engage with our content. As the owner of the largest fiber network in Brazil, OI started its strategy transformation in 2018, focusing on the FBB area. Recently, it has achieved great progress by extending the fiber network, as well as providing unrivaled customer experience support. Now it's time to welcome OI CEO Rodrigo Abreu to share the details of their success journey and their future strategy that OI will adopt in the digital economy. Please welcome to the stage, Rodrigo Abreu. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd uh, uh, like to uh, thank uh, Huawei for the invitation and for putting together UBBF 21. And also like to thank our Dubai hosts. It's always great to be back to live events and Dubai is always a center of uh, innovative uh, thinking in terms of technology and in terms of the future directions for uh, what we're doing. And so it's a pleasure to be here with you. And let me start by telling you the story of a transformation. And after everything we heard in the previous presentations about the future trends in the consumption of technology, how broadband is changing our lives, and the future demands that happen because of the pandemics and everything that's happening, at the network infrastructure and the network architecture levels. Let me tell you how all of this is helping transform an entire company. And uh, I'm talking about OI, and uh, we're calling the presentation from an integrated telecom carrier to a digital services, a digital experiences company. So for those who don't know what OI is, if it works, OI was born as the largest integrated telecom carrier in Brazil after a merger of two of the largest carriers in the country back in 2008, Telemar and Brazil Telecom. And when it was created, it was by far the largest uh, integrated operator with uh, close to 22 million uh, telephony subscribers, close to 30 million cellular subscribers. And uh, in a growing uh, broadband scenario, it had close to 4.5 million uh, DSL subscribers. Obviously, after that, 
a lot of things changed. Uh, broadband continued to grow, but the technology changed. Copper became obsolete, and a number of things happened with the company, leading to a very difficult situation that led the company to declare bankruptcy protection back in 2016. This was not only due to the technology, but also due to several governance concerns and lack of investments. And when you don't invest in telecoms, exactly this happens. It's very difficult to move forward. Uh, we entered into the largest judicial recovery program in uh, the history of Brazil corporations with a 65 billion debt. It's approximately four or five uh, dollars to one here, uh, reais to one dollar here. And the company had frozen investments. Uh, there was a big dispute amongst uh, shareholders and creditors. But finally, things started to change in 2018 when the company approved this uh, recovery plan. Uh, we had some debt restructuring. We implemented a completely new governance with a new board. I joined as a board member back in 2018. We provided for a capital increase and started uh, doing our operational recovery. And finally, a new transformation plan was announced in the second half of 2019. And why are we talking about UBBEF here and uh, the story of OI? Because this whole plan was centered around the ultra broadband opportunity and the fiber opportunity. It was a very ambitious investment plan in fiber and also looking at the digital services to complement all of the fiber connectivity. As we were there, fiber war, uh, in fact, our, it was in fact our core asset. It was a competitive differentiator, and OE has probably one of the largest fiber networks in the world. We cover the entire country, and it's a big country with a population of over 200 million people and 8 million square kilometers. And we cover the entire country with a huge fiber network, both on the backbone and on the backhaul, as well as on metropolitan fiber, with over 400,000 kilometers of fiber. It's a, an OTN, 100 gigabit uh, backbone in the entire country, even in some of the most distant regions in the Amazon. And uh, with that, we're able to uh, very quickly upgrade our entire network to become a 400 gig or even a one tera gig, uh, a one tera network uh, that covers the entire country. We cover over 2,300 cities. Brazil has 5,500 cities. But those 2,300 cities actually concentrate uh, roughly 90% of our population. So in reality, we are present in the entire country. And in addition to the fiber, we also have legacy infrastructure in all of the other municipalities in Brazil. And this was a big differentiator. But back in 2018, 2019, we were not exploring those assets sufficiently. To give you an idea, uh, by 2018, we have dropped all the way from 22 million users in uh, telephony to 8 million, and this is continuing to drop very significantly ever since. We were just the third player. From having a 40% market share, we went down to 19% market share in broadband, and uh, only with uh, less than uh, 100,000 connections in fiber, we had uh, 4.8 million DSL connections by the end of 2018. Even though we grew in mobile, we had uh, close to 37 million subscribers. We were uh, the number four player in Brazil, behind all of the other three large uh, mobile operators. And we started a TV business, but still with uh, 1.5 million subscribers only. So we had to do something. And fiber was the basis for a very bold move. We decided in our plan, by looking at all of our different businesses, to completely transform the company by divesting our mobile operations. So we engaged into uh, the sale of our mobile operations that resulted in the largest M&A in Brazil last year. And we sold our mobile operations to the three other key areas for 16.5 billion reais, uh, close to uh, four or five billion dollars. We completely interrupted the sales of legacy copper and DSL. And it's always hard to tell a sales team that you're not selling this anymore. It's very hard to tell salespeople not to sell, but that's exactly what we told them. And we migrated our entire efforts to growing the B2C, the SME, and the B2B customers focused on fiber and digital experiences and the IT services. We completely shifted our CapEx. We ramped up our CapEx again. If we look at what we were in 2016, we almost doubled that by 2019. And we have been concentrating a never increasing percentage of our capex entirely in fiber. And this transformation plan actually achieved very impressive results. 
Obviously, when we launched the plan, the pandemics was not still here, but the pandemics uh, actually simply accelerated our plan. And after two years, the numbers that we can show are very significant. We saw that uh, we grew from uh, close to uh, less than a million homes passed uh, with fiber, and we're going to end this year with 15 million homes passed with fiber. This is a rate of 500,000 homes passed per month. And uh, in terms of homes connected, we had 90,000, less than 100,000 homes connected uh, at the beginning of 2019. And we're going to end this year with almost 4 million homes connected. So very impressive growth. That's why we're telling that we're executing probably one of the largest FTTH programs globally. Uh, and uh, this has come uh, by comparing to other countries uh, that have invested in fiber heavily with uh, really a, a global benchmark, not only a national benchmark, but a global benchmark. And those are numbers from the Q2 of last year, 2020, but the numbers are relatively the same this year. In Q2 of 2020, we were able to install 360,000 new consumers with fiber. And uh, if you look at the U.S., the number one player in the U.S. installed uh, 225, the number two player in Brazil, 211, and the number one player in the U.K., just uh, over barely over 100,000 homes connected. So it is a very, very fast deployment, and we're very proud of having achieved that. And these results led yet to another uh, very, very bold decision, which was to move towards structural separation between all of our infrastructure and our customer services. And this is complementing our strategic transformation plan. We still need to create a sustainable company, so we took a decision to provide the structural separation, which basically splits the company in two parts. One part focused on the infrastructure and serving all other operators, one part entirely focused on customers, asset lights, really just concerned about developing products and services. This is a reality in many countries. It started uh, in the uh, UK with uh, BT Open Reach and also had very uh, well-known uh, experiences in Australia with NBN, but then it pretty much uh, spread and there are several uh, structural separation initiatives uh, throughout the globe. But we are providing what we believe is probably one of the largest structural separation initiatives ever in terms of uh, global presence. And uh, with that, we are creating two separate companies. The new OI, which is uh, the customer-centric, customer-focused company, all looking at all of the B2C and SME customers, at the B2B customers, focusing on the service infrastructure and developing products and services, asset light. And one company, which we are calling Vital. Vital is the name of uh, the neutral network provider that has all of the fiber infrastructure in the country, including the backbone, the backhaul, all of the FTTH connections, the rights of way, the poles, the ducts. And we expect to accelerate the entire transformation and inclusion in terms of fiber infrastructure in the country by having this company now have a much, much bigger investment capacity due to a new controller. We sold a controlling stake in this company to uh, one of the large investment banks in Brazil called BTG. And with that, we ended up creating the largest private equity deal in the history of the country. We sold uh, the company for uh, over 20 billion reais, and now we're going to remain with a stake of 42% in the company. So it was a very bold move, and now we're uh, in the middle of the execution of that. What remains after that? Starting with the new OI, we are now looking at beyond connectivity. Obviously, connectivity is critical. Connectivity is at the core of most of our revenues. It will continue growing very significantly for us, but we want to go beyond connectivity. And for that, we put together a vision and a mission. Our vision is to be the leader in digital solutions and digital experiences and optical fiber connections which improve people's and companies' lives in the entire country. And this is a very important component of our vision because uh, at the beginning, people believed that fiber was just for high-income scenarios, high-income populations and uh, developed areas. What we're doing is we're bringing fiber to every home, even Class C, Class D, low-income populations, and this is changing their lives. And that's what we want to do. And our mission is exactly to create those new futures by enabling the digital life for everyone. We have a series of assets to do that, including uh, over 50 million uh, revenue-generating units with over 13 million residences in Brazil today. 
and are also covering uh, close to 1 million companies. We have long-term relationships, recurring revenue with our customers, access to our customers' homes. And in reality, one of our secrets is that in order to do that, we've created our own installation and uh, network deployment company. We have over 23,000 technicians in the entire country. They're our own, they're not outsourced. And now we go there with our technicians, with our training, and we provide a very consistent service, and this has enabled us to be very successful in our deployment. We also have brand awareness and an unmatched capillarity in terms of physical presence, in addition to obviously having a gigantic sales machine in the country. In addition to that, we are looking beyond connectivity, as I mentioned, and we have a goal of not only growing our network in terms of a core fiber connections by three times, but also moving towards the digital experiences ecosystem, leveraging everything we have to go to the digital home, to health, to education, to marketplaces, even to energy solutions, and in addition to providing all of the traditional IT and the new world of IT solutions for B2B corporations, such as big data, AI, clouds, private networks, and this is going to help us again grow the revenues in uh, over 50% in a period of just three years. In addition to that, we have Vital, the uh, net neutral network company that uh, will unleash the fiber future for Brazil. It is by far the largest telecom infrastructure company in the country with the most comprehensive fiber infrastructure serving both as a cornerstone for FTTH growth and now for FTTR growth, because we plan to go on the FTTR route as well, as well as 5G. We're going to enable the growth of 5G in Brazil with a complete portfolio of FTTX, including serving all of the different carriers in the country. This company is going to have massive investments of 30 billion until 2025, and we're calling it one infrastructure, multiple networks, and all futures. Now, just for a few key lessons uh, and enablers in our journey. The first one is we have to focus on leveraging our key assets. We need to understand where is our competitive differentiation, and we went from lagger to leader by implementing fiber and using our existing fiber, and now in pretty much almost half of the cities we enter, we very quickly take leadership in the fiber position, and we now are leaders in 13 state capitals in 55 cities in the country, and we intend to become the national fiber leader in the entire country. We created over 3 billion reais of new revenues in two years, and we plan to triple that in the next three years. So triple revenue, three years. It's a very impressive feat, and this is going to help us compensate for the entire revenue that is going away with copper. And we obviously gained a lot of market share. We gained over 20 percentage points in market share in just under two years. The second lesson is to put your actions and your money where your mouth is. When we created our strategy, we devised a number of things that we had to do, but we really done it. We uh, actually were bold to do them. We interrupted the legacy copper sales. We now have a, a goal of completely getting away with uh, the copper network in uh, three to four years. And we obviously are growing our fiber network to compensate for that. We completely shifted our CapEx investments and we redirected most of our CapEx to fiber. And we divested mobile, which was a bold decision as well because mobile was our biggest business but we decided to sell mobile to concentrate on our future because we had the core fiber as a differentiator. Number three, let's bet on future trends. We were one of the first companies to embark in the F5G journey when uh, Huawei presented that to us back in 2019. And we see that uh, in reality, by focusing on the cloud VR era of the F5G, we really are very attuned to uh, what is coming in terms of the future opportunities for the digital life, both for cloud, smart home, online gaming, the transformation of the enterprises, security, education, telemedicine, and obviously providing core connectivity. Then we also had to invest in our key differentials, both on the B2C as well as on the B2B. On the B2C, we are now going beyond connectivity with a number of products that we have already launched. So we do have solutions for technical assistance, 
for content. So we have our own content platform for digital wallets, for marketplaces, for cloud security and managed services. And this is complementing our whole digital life vision. And on the to be sides, we also have used our assets to provide very differentiated service in terms of enterprise solutions. We now manage entire networks for 1,000 of the largest enterprises in Brazil. And now we have uh, been creating very differentiated services that allows us to be a true solutions integrator in this space. As a success case, just to give you an idea, the last large big event in Brazil was Rock in Rio back in 2019, and we created an entire connected city with over 12 million connections in the period of just a couple of weeks, over uh, 170 terabytes of traffic, and we prevented daily thousands and thousands of cyber attacks. And finally, develop strategic partnerships along the way. And we have de developed those strategic network uh, partnerships, uh, in particular, one very solid partnership with Huawei. We can see here that we're covering pretty much all elements of the network strategy in terms of F5G, transport, tools for having a zero-touch network, having a view of how to migrate to XGS and all optical solutions, looking at all of the edge computing and telco cloud solutions. So we're, we're looking at pretty much the entire spectrum of network partnerships because we know that this is at the core of what we do and will be at the core of what the new infrastructure company does. But we also went beyond the network and we developed very interesting initiatives with Huawei to provide services directly to our customers in terms of uh, introducing solutions for smart cities, creating entire connected cities in parts of Brazil, creating uh, very novel solutions for public safety and security. We just uh, uh, started implementing with Huawei an entire state covered uh, with uh, smart cameras and smart monitoring, with uh, face recognition, with uh, license plate recognition, monitoring an entire state with a private LTE network, which is going to certainly evolve to a private 5G network. And we're going to continue doing that. So we're already looking towards the next opportunities. We know that uh, this is a, a huge space of opportunities for us now that we are uh, very focused on the two sides of our strategy and we plan to continue on uh, investing in those partnerships. Now, next steps in our journey. Obviously, we need to complete our structural transformation. We plan to have completed this structural transformation by the first quarter of next year. Obviously, we need to continue growing our core business and connectivity is critical. It will continue to be critical. We are driving and growing our incremental revenues based on the digital life. We are migrating all of the legacy copper users and we're getting rid of our legacy infrastructure. And finally, we're consolidating the largest infrastructure company in Brazil. So that was a quick turnaround case, turnaround story to show what's possible to do when uh, we have the partnerships, we have the vision. We have the understanding of the opportunities ahead and how we transform the very difficult situation in most likely a big success turnaround story. Thank you for having us. Okay. Big thank you to Rodrigo Abreu there for another phenomenal presentation. Huawei truly believes that more and more Brazilians can enjoy a better digital life and get more value from their Viber network expansion through the digital capabilities of OI. Saudi Arabia 2030, its vision, Saudi Vision 2030, is a strategic framework to reduce Saudi Arabia's dependency on oil and as an effort to diversify its economy and develop public service sectors. It is trying to make Saudi Arabia the hub that is connecting three continents. As one of the leading operators in Saudi Arabia, Mobily is dedicated to building a digital foundation for the digital economy to accelerate new digital streams. However, the question is, how can Mobily leverage its leading all optical network to build the solid infrastructure foundation that is needed to drive digital transformation and to drive new business growth? To find out, Let's hear from Ala Al Malki, CTO of Mobile Saudi Arabia, to share their all net optical network strategy and best practices with us. Please invite Ala Al Malki onto the stage.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the UBB to make me uh, making the speech about our transformation that we did in uh, in the transport network. Um, it's my glad to present for you a leading optical network in the new blue ocean growth. I think this is the longest uh, title that I have present. Anyways, it looks very beautiful, I think, with the wild screen. But uh, uh, it's very important for us that our uh, transformation has been built on our vision, which is 2030. Our vision was very clear from the Crown Prince that Saudi Arabia needs to depend on non-oil resources. This is very difficult for a, a young nation to change their strategy, but I think we have a very clear vision where to do with that. Saudi Arabia position is very good from the location. We are in the middle of the world. We can connect Europe with Africa, Asia, and of course, we have the two holy cities. It's very important that we know that we are building new cities. Neum is a big example, Red Sea, and even Gedea areas. All this makes a major challenges for Mobile. However, looking at it as a second operator, we are very eager to grow. Our revenues is growing. We have 10 million subscribers. We invest heavily in the 5G. But one of the important things that we believe in data centers before everyone, we have the first tier three and tier four in Saudi Arabia in 2015, long time ago, we predicted the future. And today, we're glad to have the biggest IoT network in the Middle East, not in Saudi Arabia. Our strategy, which is gain, is built on growth. So growth is the main factor. And of course, going to a digital revenues, efficiency, and of course, not to forget our customer experience. All that has been putting up on this huge transformation that we are doing. I have to tell you that this transformation was not an easy one. Looking at it three years ago, we make that decision, and the implementation of that transformation has been done during COVID-19. The difficulties of having products coming on time was an issue. Even sending your field team to change your backbone was even an issue. However, we managed to finish all these challenges, and we managed to close this project on time. It's very difficult to run two networks in the same time with the cost element, the experience, changing all your transport network with the zero outages. I would like to thank my team for their work and my Deloitte vendor, Huawei, for working on that. A very important element that we were working on is how we could manage to transform our network. This transformation is very important. It's important from four elements. We have four corners that we have to focus on in this project. We have to make a transformation in the technology, in the operational side, on the digitalization side, and of course, not to forget our business. Technology, of course, is the main course where we need to focus in to manage to differentiate ourselves. It's very important to imagine that you want to move from red ocean to a blue ocean. And this is very, very important if you want to differentiate yourself in the market. When it comes to technology, we could manage to use the super C spectrum going from 80 lambda to 120 lambda, which give us a 50% increase in capacity. 
Just today, we're finishing our commercial offer, which is around 80, 800 gigabit per second. Five times. We could manage to increase our capacity five times. This ultra-large capacity with the, comes with the ultra-latency, thanks to the new modulation on the coherent, that we could reduce our latency by 30%. Of course, operation is always a main factor. Reducing the cost will always be something that we're working on, especially in the telecom. In the operation, we just not focus on reducing the cost. We managed to get the five nines by the self-healing network concept. The WSON and rerouting the traffic Managing to restore the problems with multiple fiber cuts was a main element of the success of this project. Also, discovering the location of the fiber cut, going from the legacy way, where you have people driving the car, trying to find where is the location, and getting an, a GIS location with a couple of meters accuracy to reach the location and manage to restore the network immediately. Digitalization, I mean, this is the main factor of doing the transformation. And in the digitalization, you can get the full visibility. A complete network dashboard with the clear guidance of how to restore your actions. And all in one with artificial intelligence, give us a clear business cases of how we can predict this is not a science fiction. We can predict where the fiber cut. This is we already developed with a very intelligent system that could calculate the vibrations on the ground and tell you, go fast, there's someone is digging there, and go stop them. You move your operation action from a reactive to proactive. And it's very important for our industry. Of course, this can only be done with the full management. Correlation of active and passive components can give you a very strong position when you look to your assets, when you evaluate your situation, and you're restoring your problems. Of course, we're doing all this for our business. And this is a fact, whether we like it or not. The consumer will not be growing that much. If you can manage to maintain it, that's great. The growth is going to come on the business side. The 5G cases will come on the 5G. Cases will come from the business side. And you have to build a very strong backbone network to do that. We could manage with this transformation to have a brilliant wholesale deal, could manage to connect the continent together. Also, we can have a premium, premium private line with a, with a premium revenue that we could establish from latency point of view, from availability point of view, for so many industries. Of course, banking is one of them, but we can have multiple of options. Today, mobile is the main driver for data centers. And these data centers are the main factors of our future growth. Everything will be on the cloud. Everything will be NFV. It will require a major capacity on the backbone in order to move into that direction. Of course, look into the future. Having all these kind of businesses, smart factory, smart connectivity, and all of these private networks would require this strong backbone and transformations. We were very happy 
to look at our empowering our digital world to unblock all our future growth in this arena. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Ala Al Maliki there for another incredible presentation. Huawei believes Mobile's leading all optical network will bring more and more possibilities to all industries and drive their business growth as well. Today, many leading operators share their success stories and network strategies for the future. And Huawei believes connectivity will extend further and be ubiquitous in the future. However, the quality of connectivity and customer experience will be further improved as well. However, the question is, how do equipment suppliers support operators to implement these strategies much better, quicker, and more efficiently? To find out more and to tell us a little bit more about this, please welcome Mr. Bill Wang, Vice President of Huawei's Optical Business Product Line, to share innov Huawei's innovative solutions and tell us how these solutions can boost operators' business success and resiliency. Please welcome Bill Wang onto the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So today, I will introduce Huawei's optical network. Yeah, we, as we previous speech, we have seen we have seen see the that for the. Yeah, for the FTTR and also for the, yeah, for the, yeah, for the whole broadband, for the all optical that is, became the most important, yeah, for the, for the whole industry. So today my topic, my topic, I'd like to introduce all optical connectivity to drive the business growth. And we'll release two products support our customer keeping go ahead. So first, we have seen the pandemic drive rapid growth of whole broadband and the number of the FTTH user is basically booming. By the last of months, FTDR order reached more than 100,000. We expect by the end of the 2022, the FTDR will be deployed in more than 4 million homes and will reach 100 million in three years. For the enterprise market, more than 90 operators have launched OTM premium private line products, and more are planning to launch in the next few years. However, there are still around 1 billion homes unconnected by FTTH. There are only 20 million gig per pound users globally. And more than 90% of the home are still under 100 megabits. 99% of the enterprise are not connected by OTM premium provide line. So how can we extend optical connectivity to each home, each enterprise, each office, and each campus? Today, I will release two key products to help operators to extend the optical connectivity. Additional ODN deployment is highly skilled, yet there is always a shortage of skill leap. This can lead together 
high capex and opex in the long run. In summary, traditional Olding construction faces three key challenges, high cost, Olding investor ratio in FTH is normally more than 70%. Second, slow provisioning. Average service assignment is more than seven days, even more longer. Third one, a difficult OEM. Unnecessary site visit account for more than 70%. Huawei do the innovation end-to-end -end digital quick holding use. We summarize one push connection for faster construction. One scan management for faster provisioning and one click maintenance for faster troubleshooting. To implement split free network construction in all scenario. And implement precise and virtualized management for passive ODN network. First of all, I will introduce Huawei provider highly reliable and ultra low insertion loss quick connect technology. With one push connection, Huawei DQ ODN can provide a flexible ODN networking and a support network construction without splicing and the box reopening for the whole process. And this solution applied to all scenarios, such as like error, dirt, and high risk building. Secondly, with the imaging recognition technology, Huawei delivered a mobile app to automatically collect and upload OD network information, such as device port quantity and also the GIS information. Then, the system can automatically generate the OD network top knowledge to make the physical OD site digitalized and virtualized. Without paper record and manually typing, it guarantees 100% long term accuracy of ODN resource. During the service provisioning, the NM system can automatically match the optimized resource for the new subscribers, improving the one time service provisioning success to 100%. Third, with the innovative five iris technology, Huawei DQOD can intelligently identify the key feature change of both the downlink and the uplink signal, such like the face and intense of optical signal after they pass through OD network. With big data analysis, the NMS platform can automatically generate the OD link loss restore the whole FTTH to plot and support minute and mid-level process for the locating to achieve one-click maintenance. Today, I were prepared to release the four scenario digital quick ODN using the iBox, Hardbox, and Subbox. We already be used in the highest, the mountain, Kumalangma, 4,200 meters. And also, in the coldest temperature, minus 40 degree in the Arctic Circle, and in the hottest temperature of 48 degree in the UAE. 
We believe that this solution can be deployed in any scenario and help to connect more and more unconnect in the future. By extending OTN DWDM to the site, we can build our optical setting to ensure the premium experience for all service. To achieve the target, we are facing three challenges. First, equipment deployment is still tough. For example, 60% of metro access sites have limited space and power for operator in the worldwide. Second, network evolution is difficult to equip the capacity. It's not big enough. Last, new service require less latency, hop up, and a very screenuality. To address the above challenge, we are glad to release Optics Trans OS 1800 Pro product. Optical Trends OS and 18 Pro products support full scenario deployment and full service transmission. There are three key technology insights. First, Blade OXC, empowered by the aircross-based optical switching, support one optical direction, one slot. Reduce space by 75%. XZ makes them compact and flexible enough to deploy it in any scenario. Second, thanks to the silicon photonic technology, the size and the power consumption are redu reduced by more than 60%. Meanwhile, the capacity is increased by five times. Third, liquid OTN technology. It is OSU-based slicing, support 2 meg up to the 100G service access. HD's bandwidth on demand and ultra-low latency, providing premium connectivity for various industry. The highly integrated ODN is easier to be deployed to each OLT site to extend the premium optical connectivity to the organization from large enterprise to small and medium enterprise. The large enterprise will be connected by the OTN directly, and this is OTN P2P, premium private line. For the large quantity of the small SME, Huawei has launched an innovative OTN P2MP solution to help the operator extend the business boundary, which has introduced the OTN technology to the Pong network. This will enlarge the customer base by 100 times. When all optical network is applied in industry, it could facilitate digital transformation and build an all optical foundation for smart city with improved security, efficiency, and experience. For example, when all optical is introduced into the factory, extended to the machine, it could build an anti interference, safe, and low latency connectivity. Applied in hospital, it can ensure the massive data transmission and the support 
telemedicine. We believe that all optical networks will be the solid foundation to enrich all life and work and boost digital transformation. All optical network will be the key contributor to drive the home broadband and enterprise revenue growth. We believe that the optical, all optical network is the one. Within the one, how many zero you have, that means nothing. So we'd like to together with the all customer, the whole industry, extend the connectivity. Even today, we need to go to the all optical connectivity to Keep driving the business growth together. Thank you.